All right, Mike. Well, we've got some questions here. We might as well get into them if you're ready. Sure. All right. Our first one is from Michael. And he says, as a fellow Michael, I have heard you mention the archangel by the same name. And as I understand, it means who is like God. And certain groups like Jehovah Witness use that to mean Jesus was Michael or vice versa. I see some parallels and don't necessarily think it is a huge or even salvation issue, but I have wrestled with this and I'm curious about your thoughts on the matter. Yeah, well, well, Michael, first of all, it's not a statement. It's not like, I hate to do the grammar talk here, but it's not like a relative pronoun, the word the word that can mean who, which, or that is like God. So it's not a, it's not a statement, who is like God, the one who is like God. It's actually a question. It's asking a question, who is like God? So me, in, in Hebrew, is the interrogative pronoun to, to ask a question, who, question mark. And then ka is, is your comparative particle, as or like. And then el is God. So me, ka, el, is a question, who is like God? It's a rhetorical you know, sort of question. So if you're using that to sort of say it's a, similarity to God, like a, like a declarative statement. If the Jehovah's Witness logic is, is using it in that way, it, it, it sort of implodes out of the gate. They, they misunderstand what Mikael uh, is in terms of Hebrew. Uh, on, on Michael himself, I would the best answer I can give you is to read my angel's book right around pages 68 to 73, those four, five, six pages there, uh, identifying in, in this whole is that the short version would be Michael is, as the text of Daniel 10 says, one of the chief princes. So he's one of a group of chief princes. So unless we have a group of Jesuses, which is, is even hard to say, in the spiritual world, the logic equating Jesus and Michael implodes again. You, you, Jesus wouldn't be unique, even in their view. He'd, he'd be a, a, one among a group of, of equals. So Michael is one of the chief princes, and by virtue of that, again, if that's Jesus, then we've got more than one Jesus. We've got a bunch of Jesuses up there, too. So that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So Michael, if you're going to read through the book of Daniel, has a superior in the book of Daniel, the prince of the Lord's host, you know, the prince of the host, or the prince of princes, uh, various titles, you know, or Daniel 8 through 10. And the former of those, this idea of the prince of the Lord's host, is parallel to the figure of Joshua 5, the captain of the Lord's army. It's the same word, Tsar, captain or Tsar, prince. It's the commander of the Lord's army. So, you know, that, that figure, as I've, again, I, I talk about in my angel's book and also in Unseen Realm, that figure is the angel of the Lord. And we know that because of the phrase in Joshua 5, that the, the figure is standing there with his draw, the drawn sword, his drawn sword in his hand. That's a phrase, the exact phrase occurs only two other places in the Hebrew Bible, and both of them are used to the angel of the Lord. So if the angel of the Lord is Yahweh in, in human form, well, there you have your precursor to Jesus, Yahweh in human form. The, the figure is Yahweh. It's, 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 it's again part of the two Yahweh's complex, that we have, we have these figures that like the angel who is but isn't Yahweh. He is Yahweh, but yet Yahweh, invisible and transcendent, can also be in the same scene with the angel. They can be separate figures or their identities can be blurred. And so, again, this is something I discuss at length in Unseen Realm. In, in that case, the two Yahweh stuff, it's, it's going to be around pages, I don't know, 120 to 150, somewhere in there. It's chapter 16 through 18. But there's, you know, there's a lot to it, so I'm not going to read five pages here to answer this question. But that's the short version. Tamarit says he is an Ethiopian who lives in the U.S. now. And his question is on 2 Kings 1.9 about the captain of 50 men with the 50 that King Ahaziah sends to Elijah. Why were they killed? Weren't they simply messengers who just said the king said to come down? Looks like the messengers that were sent to inquire of Beelzebub, whom Elijah encounters, were treated as nothing more than mere messengers and were not harmed. Why were the captains of 50 men killed? 
Well, I don't, I don't know that we can read that into it, that, that one group was, I mean, this happens three times, you know, all, all total. So it, ha- it happens two other, two previous times, a third group was spared. The last group is the one that's spared. The first two groups are the ones that are not. So the, the third captain shows respect to Elijah and, and Yahweh. He acknowledged Yahweh's authority and power and asked to be spared. So he, he was. There's no indication that the other groups did either their leader, you know, their, 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 the captain of the 50 or any of the 50. They didn't humble themselves before Yahweh. The episode is also spiritual warfare against Baal. And I, don't, I think we should not lose sight of this. You got to recall that the chapter begins with Ahaziah seeking to inquire of Baalzebub, the god of Ekron, for deliverance from his illness. You know, he has a particular illness. He wants deliverance, so he's going to inquire of Baalzebub. The, he, he, you know, he sends this delegation, and they get intercepted by Elod, Elijah at Yahweh's direction and turn back. And, and that's fine. Nobody dies. You know, he just sends them back. But then Ahaziah sends companies of 50 it really it, in a series of retaliations against Elijah, Yahweh's prophet, and ultimately Yahweh himself. You know, this is, this is a sending the, the companies of 50. Or, this is an act of defiance against God. So his men pay for that defiance with their lives when they encounter the prophet of Yahweh and challenge him and Yahweh with their demands. Again, they don't, they don't humble themselves at all until the last group. God chooses to make them all an object lesson and to belittle Baal. So we have to ask questions like, where is Baal to protect them? Where is Baal to thwart Yahweh's will in regard to Ahaziah's illness? Baal is absent and feckless. And that's part of the, of, you know, of, of the teaching point of the drama. He's not only powerless to save Ahaziah, but he's also powerless to save the soldiers under him. So, you know, ultimately, God gets to decide how evil and defiance is dealt with. In this case, it costs some men their lives when they're defiant. You serve another God, you play at your own risk. I mean, that, that's the teaching point of the passage. Andrew has our next question. I looked up September 11th, 2001 on a Jewish calendar, and that is the 23rd of Elul, first day of Tishri, is one week later on September 18th. I know Mike often sells himself short, but he is too good of a scholar to make a mistake that is so easily disproved by a cursory look at a Jewish calendar. If September 11th, 2001 wasn't the first day of Tishri, how could it be a shot across the bow from the demonic forces to God on Jesus' birthday? What am I missing? Well, you're missing, you can't just pick up a Jewish calendar for today and, and, and assume that it aligns, you know, astronomically with something that happened in 2 or 3 BC. So that, that's the, the big assumption. Not every date falls on the same day every year, especially when you're talking about the Jewish calendar. The standard Jewish calendar suffers slippage over the course of years and periodically requires a 13th month to be inserted to align it with Passover. This is still done today. And it goes all the way back to antiquity because the, the, the standard calendar you know, is used today, is drawn from the Torah. And that's a lunar calendar. And you don't, have, you don't have months of equal days. They don't add up to 365. So every once in a while, you'd have to insert extra days into the calendar to make the description of when you're supposed to observe Passover line up with the calendar you're using. This is the whole reason why the, the Essenes at Qumran refused to use the Jewish calendar of, of antiquity of their this goes all the way back to ancient times. They refused to use it because men had to add days to it to make it work periodically. So they, they thought it was a human contrivance. So the people at Qumran used a, a, a calendar of 360 days plus four days between the four quadrants, uh, four 90-day quadrants. That added up to 364. But they used that calendar because it was mathematically perfect. Uh, if you use that one, all of your feasts and festivals are going to happen the same day every year for mathematical reasons. And they knew that it wouldn't match real-time astronomy. They knew that missing that 365 and a quarter, that day and a quarter, you know, would, would cause slippage around the seasons. But they didn't care because they were, they were going for the, for the ritual. They were not trying to align it 
uh, with the seasons. We, we also have to remember that the, the calendar that Judaism uses today was not the original ancient biblical calendar. The original ancient biblical calendar was, was one that was agrarian. It, it, aligned to, it aligned to feast and festivals. It was an agrarian calendar. Only when you get to the, the time of the Exodus does God institute a new calendar, and then he gives precise days for when Passover is supposed to be. We have a new first month. You know, God just declares that the, the month that you came out of Egypt, well, that's the first month now. So we're going to have a new calendar. And that calendar is not the same as the original Old Testament, you know, Jewish calendar. And because of the fact that you have to keep adding days to it periodically, it means that you can't just pick up a calendar today and, and try to make some sort of alignment back to a time that's, you know, 3 and 2 BC date. All the the astronomical sources that, that I have that get into this issue have September 11th, either 3 or 2 BC as Tishri 1. So, you know, there, there's a lot more to it than just picking up a Jewish calendar off the internet or something like that and looking at what day it is in our calendar today. Daryl has our next question. He has a question about Genesis 4, 7 and Leviticus 1, 3 through 4. I was listening to Mike talk about acceptance as the goal of the burnt offering. And I couldn't help but notice that in Genesis 4, 7 in the ESV, Yahweh says to Cain, if you do well, will you not be accepted? Could it be that Abel was offering a sort of burnt offering before Yahweh involving blood to cleanse a space? And Cain's offering was not. And as a result, Cain's offering was not treated the way Abel's was. Well, this that, that would be a guess, and honestly, it's it might be as good of a guess as any other guesses when it comes to Genesis chapter four and why Cain's offering, you know, was not accepted. It's hard to know because Cain and Abel are you know, the story is set in in days that are before the Levitical laws. Now, you know, you, you this gets you into well, if it was written, and it was, the text is written after the time of time period of the story. Maybe the writers just inserted Levitical stuff in there, they're kind of like the clean and unclean, you know, animals that are that are you know put on the ark and taken off. The whole clean and unclean concept wouldn't happen for a long, long time later, but there it is in the story. So it you know it's possible that we can have this kind of um, thinking going on in the Cain and Abel story, even though the story is set prior to Levitical law. Uh, and, and concepts of sacred space and whatnot, but it's it's a little more than a guess. I, I would also caution that you you can't use you, you can't use English words. I mean, when I am talking in the podcast series in Leviticus one, I'm I'm using ESV language. I'm using English, so a word like accept or acceptance. You, you, we can't necessarily think that that's the same word as occurs back in Genesis 4. In this case, it's not. Um, the, the words are not the same. The Hebrew words are not the same. So we have to be be cautious about, you know, when we, when we hear someone talk about the Bible and use English translation, um, it might sound the same in two passages when it's actually different. Uh, the, the one in Genesis 4, 7 is about lifting up. And there's an exp- biblical expression to lift up the face. And it, it, it can denote acceptance, you know, that two parties are on good terms with each other. It, it, it can denote that. But the, the Hebrew terminology used in Leviticus is actually different. So, again, we just need to be a little, little cautious there. Last one from Doug in College Station, Texas. I will not say gigum, although I just did because you're Aggies, Mike. I don't know <laughs> if you know about the Aggies, but. You either love them or you hate I know, them. I know. I've heard the I've heard the Aggies, but I don't know what Gigum is. I don't either, Mike. I don't. I don't either. I don't either. To be honest, no, that's okay. We'll move along. Move along. Can't talk about Aggies too much. I've got several friends that are Aggies, so we get into play fights all the time. Okay, Mike. Doug has a question about Yahweh's relationship to Israel being contrasted with his relationship to other nations plus Michael's relationship to Israel, since Daniel 10 calls him Daniel's or Israel's prince. What should we make of this title that Yahweh gets many times in the Psalms and Isaiah, the Holy One of Israel? I presume that communicates the idea that Israel is his portion. He did not give them to 
another being, but kept them for himself. So all nations have their own Holy One. But Yahweh himself is Israel's Holy One. Is that right? Additionally, in Mark and Luke, Legion says to Jesus, I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Is that different than the Holy One of Israel? What does it mean that Jesus is the Holy One of God? The disciples also call Jesus by this title in John six sixty nine. Still, Daniel 10 depicts a few items related to all of that, but still rather confusing. It depicts a being whose description is like a stock description of God on the throne. That's Jesus, right? This person says, though, that he fought the prince of Persia for 21 days, and the prince of Persia withstood him, and Michael came to help him. So that must not be Jesus, it's anthropomorphic Yahweh, right? Because God wouldn't need help fighting anyone. And that person, the prince of Persia, is a rebellious holy one, right? And also the prince of Greece, who is also mentioned there, right? At the very end of Daniel 10, it says that Michael is Daniel's or Israel's prince. So does that mean that Yahweh is not Israel's holy one, but Michael is? That's all quite confusing. Well, I would agree it is confusing, and the question is confusing. There's about 10 questions in here, and honestly, I don't know that I can even follow what was going on in there. A couple of things. If we presume that the figure fighting the Prince of Persia is Michael's superior, if we assume that, and we have to make it, make that assumption for the sake of saying something about that, at least that part of the question or the series of questions. We should not assume that, that God cannot be opposed. Why would we assume that? We can resist the Holy Spirit. Paul tells us that, tells us not to do it. The Spirit can be quenched by us. Okay, the fact that you have God and deity and the fact that God will get his way in the end doesn't mean that God, you know, this doesn't mean that spiritual warfare isn't real. God can be resisted. He can be opposed. Okay, what he wants to, to have happen can be thwarted, but God is, is ultimately going to win. We can do all those things, much less a, a supernatural being like the Prince of Persia. So I think we read a little too much into, the, into this 21 days thing. And, and, and by virtue of maybe theology we've been brought up on, our mind goes in one particular direction and cancels out meanings or endorses other meanings. But that, that's just plucking one, like I said, out of about 10 questions out here. Um, holy, the Holy One of God is a messianic title. So it's, it's not an, an equated title with Holy One of Israel. You know, because the Messiah himself is not, the Messiah is the God-man. He's not God himself. In other words, when we have the Messiah come on the scene, the Trinity doesn't grow. It doesn't multiply. So there's, there's a bit of a mis-overlap there going on in the questions as well. But it's, it's just a messianic title. I think there's also some problem with reading the Deuteronomy 32 idea into the into both the prince's idea of Daniel 10. The princes aren't called sons of God or vice versa in Daniel. Michael being Israel's patron angelic figure is fine because that, that's how he's described in Daniel 12, for instance. But the Holy One of Israel, that title itself shouldn't be filtered through Deuteronomy 32. In other words, there's nothing about the words Holy One of Israel that, that, that root them to geography. In, in a way that a phrase like the sons of God uh, do, you know, if, if again, the context allows or the context directs us to, you know, the, the Babel event. I mean, you can have the phrase sons of God. It doesn't mean we're talking about the Babel event unless there's something in context that would direct us to think that. So, we, you know, we, we, don't, we don't have that, you know, necessarily. I mean, the, the princes are, are, are over geographical regions. That's true. But we, we get that by virtue of, this, of the description, not by virtue of the title Holy One or Holy Ones. Again, I, it, it's hard for me to even parse th these questions and come out with something coherent here. Holy One is just a supernatural being or a deity or, or something like that. Okay, in this case, the Holy One of Israel happens to be Yahweh. All Elohim, if not in rebellion, can rightfully be called Holy Ones. And they are, Psalm 89. Okay, the, the, the members of the heavenly host who are still loyal to Yahweh are holy ones. But that doesn't mean they have geographical linkages. 
I mean, the, the, the council now, the, again, the loyal council members like in Psalm 89, they're not attached to any geography, but they're called holy ones. They're called sons of God. But there's nothing in the context that links them to geography. In fact, if, you know, if, if they're the good guys, then, you know, the, 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 the patron being assigned to Israel is Michael, you know, because that's what Daniel says. And so these holy ones in Psalm 89, or these sons of God in Psalm 89, don't have any, any sort of geographical flavoring to them. So we have to look to context. So again, the, the phrase holy one of Israel doesn't require the land allotment idea. And what I mean by that is the phrase itself. Now, since it's speaking of Yahweh, well, there are other reasons, again, that Yahweh has chosen this land to give to his people and so on and so forth. But you know, he, he has Michael as steward over it in terms of the spiritual warfare conflict. That doesn't mean Yahweh's not in charge. He Yahweh's always in charge. He will get his way. But but he's in the he's in the midst of a conflict between himself as a free will being and other free will beings who are supernatural. And even free will beings who are human. Again, we can thwart the spirit. We're told not to do that. We're told not to quench the spirit. We're told not to resist. But, but we can, we do, you know, to our detriment. So we, we, we shouldn't think that because God is God, there is no conflict. There is no warfare. There is no battle that's real. That's not the picture that emerges. So I think we've got some problems there going on too. Now, I don't know if any of that helps. Because like I said, there's, there's so many questions bound up in this paragraph that in a Q&A, I don't know that I can make sense of it, but there you go. Let's just jump in, if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, first one's from Ken. And Ken asks, does Dr. Heiser see any potential threads connecting this idea of Messiah ben Joseph to episode 102 of the Naked Bible podcast? What does all Israel will be saved mean? In particular, tying it to the work of the Jason Staples paper referenced throughout that episode. Yeah, well, you you wouldn't you wouldn't need Messiah ben Joseph for all Israel being saved, especially if if the phrase means, and and again, it, you know who, who's who's going to settle this question, but if the phrase refers to non physical Israelites, you know the the seed of Abraham, as Paul talks about, referring to both Jew and Gentile, in other words, everyone who who um, is a believer. You certainly don't need the Messiah ben Joseph to be an element of that. However, having said that, this is kind of an interesting trajectory because certainly part of the Pentecost event involves the reunification of the tribes into one body. And that one body isn't isn't physical Israel anymore, but it would be the church. You know, so in, in that respect, the nomenclature here about, you know, you have a Messiah from Ephraim or Joseph and a Messiah from Judah. And they're both the same person. The, the nomenclature here does sort of cover both kingdoms. But to say any more, though, I think I need Paul to cite one or two Messiah ben Joseph texts, which he doesn't really do. So that that's that's one thing in its way. But it's it's an interesting thought trajectory. Ezekiel see should have made put into Jews that the region the tribes would happen in the new covenant, and we're living in new covenant days, which is quite clear uh, from Scripture. So that's happened, but the Messiah ben Joseph element isn't, isn't an overt part of that. Like I said, with, without Paul tapping into one of these passages that um, David uh, Mitchell referred to in, in that episode, um, I don't know how, the, how that you would make the argument other than to say it, 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 it kind of sort of looks like it's part of the picture, even though it's never made explicit. Our next one is from Paul. From Maryland, we know from Scripture that Jesus was without sin. However, being that Jesus was God and human, could he have made mistakes? I ask because it seems possible that Jesus misidentifies Ahimelech as Abiathar in Mark 2.26. I know there is scholarly debate on this issue, but could it be plausible that Jesus' human brain messed up in this instance? Yeah, I don't 
I don't, personally, I don't think so. I, I think if this was construed as a as a clear error originally, and, and the word originally is going to become important here as I try to unravel this. I think if this was construed as an original error, uh, when, when when the conversation originally happened, the Pharisees would have called Jesus on it, but they don't. And there'd be no reason for Mark to just skip it or to include it if it was an error. I mean, because the other Gospels don't even include the episode. But a, a couple of thoughts. I mean, the Paul alludes to the scholarly discussion here. So, you know, look, looking this up real quick. This is from uh, Wessel's commentary, or on Mark, excuse me. This is from the Expositor's Bible Commentary series, the volume that includes the, the Gospel of Mark. He says, the problem associated with the phrase epi abiathar akieros is well known. This is Mark 2.26, as, as you know, Paul identified. If it means, quote, at the time when Abiathar was high priest, unquote, it is incorrect historically. At the time the incident occurred, Ahimelech, Abiathar's father, was high priest, and it was from him David received the consecrated bread. The difficulty is revealed by the fact that neither Matthew nor Luke records the phrase in the parallel passages, and it is not found in several manuscripts, which, again, that it could be a late intrusion. If, because it's not found in several manuscripts. So that's one issue. Uh, continuing on with Wessel, in some manuscripts, a definite article is inserted before the, the Greek for high priest. This would make possible the translation, quote, in the time of Abiathar, the one who later became high priest, unquote. So you, you, you might, on the other, the other side of it, you might have had scribes see this as a problem and try to fix it uh, that way. Back to Wessel. It is this reconstruction that NIV's in the days of translation reflects. Another possibility is to translate the preposition epi as in the account of, as is done in Mark 12, 26, epi tu batu, in the account of the bush. So if that was the case, you know, this is me now, if that was the case, then you would have not at the time Abiathar was high priest, but you know, in the account of his becoming the high priest. So that, that would be a way to resolve the issue. But, you know, none of those solutions is entirely satisfactory. I also looked this up in, in R.T. Francis commentary. I like, I like R.T. Francis commentaries on the Gospels, so I thought I'd, I'd look up what he said. And he writes this, The name of the priest does not correspond to 1 Samuel 21, 1-9, names him as Ahimelech, who was the father of Abiathar who features prominently in David's subsequent story. There is apparently some confusion over these names since Abiathar generally appears as David's priest along with Zadok, and yet the lists in 2 Samuel 8, 17, 1 Chronicles 24, 6, give Ahimelech, son of Abiathar, as the priest along with Zadok. So even in the Old Testament, let me break in here, even in the Old Testament, there, there appears to be some variance here. Mark seems to share that confusion, France says. Abiathar was presumably there at the time. 1 Samuel 22, 20 uh, has him escaping subsequently from Nob, which is where the incident occurred, but he was not yet high priest. Now, France has a footnote, and I think this is the, for me, this is the interesting part. Uh, he footnotes Maurice Casey, who was an Aramaic specialist and a New Testament scholar. And Casey suggested that Mark's Greek derives from an Aramaic original, which he reconstructs as, quote, in the days of Abiathar, a great, a great or a chief priest, unquote. The Aramaic referred to his lifetime, not, not the fact that he would have been high priest at the time, but Mark's Greek has mistakenly made it refer to his period in office. And Casey, when he says that, he says this is a normal mistake in a bilingual text, at least in his experience working with bilingual texts. Now, we have to say that there's no evidence that Mark was written in Aramaic. There's no evidence that any of the Gospels was written originally in Aramaic. But Matthew and Mark are the, are the leading candidates in that discussion. It would make sense on a number of grounds if it were originally in Aramaic. And if it was, then you, you would have someone converted to Greek along the way. And it, and it would be at the, at the moment when, when the Aramaic was converted to Greek that you'd have this difficulty surface in the text based upon how the Greek was handled. 
um, how the how the Greek was was put, you know, in relationship to the Aramaic. So it's at least another possibility, but it's speculative. So this is one of those incidences where there there are possible solutions to it, both internally and externally when it comes to the text and translations. But you know, nobody can say for sure what what the resolution is. So that all extends far beyond something as as simple or simplistic as saying Jesus just goofed. Because again, if if that was the case, you'd you'd wonder why it was even included. And again, I, when I when I say it that way, I'm just speaking, you know, in, in human terms. If you were Mark, um, you know, why why would this be an inclusion? And since it is included, then and the Pharisees don't respond with, "Ah, oh, you made a mistake, Jesus." Chances are good that that originally um, Jesus did not make, you know, this this mistake, and we have a textual explanation for it later on. So that that's typically how how scholars you know treat the subject, and I think it, it, the, the treatment there is reasonable. But again, you know, nobody knows for sure. So it's just one of these instances where you have a problem. But you only have possible solutions. You don't. You don't have anything that you can really land on, as f- and be sure about it. Just you know, you're just in the realm of the possibilities. Our next question is from Jessica in Charleston, South Carolina. The phrase mm-hmm. "lift up your eyes" appears a lot. I think it usually signifies when the Lord has given a gift or a blessing or something very directly, and maybe has something to do with His presence or maybe the presence of the divine. I'm also sort of wondering if it has something to do with prayer. Yeah, I mean, it does occur a lot, and and there are contexts where it occurs where God is part of the scene. He's part of the, he's one of the the, the actors in the scene. And so you could have a blessing or something like that, um, or, you know, connected with a prayer that's being said. So that, that, that's going to happen in the text, but I, I think, I think uh, Jessica may be getting this idiom confused with another, and the other one is to lift up the face. Uh, lift up the face or you know, lift up your countenance. That one does denote blessing, um, but much more overtly. Uh, to, to lift up someone's face or to tell them that they should have their face lifted up uh, is often associated with you know, some kind of good news or a blessing or, or, or something like that. So that it's a little bit different than lift up your eyes. As far as I know, lift up your eyes means just take a look and see or behold, something like that. Grayson has her next question. When Moses was married to the Ethiopian woman and Miriam and Aaron speak against him, what does the story mean? Is it saying that we should tell people who to marry? Or how do you interpret it? Yeah, well, there, there's certainly no nothing that grows out of it textually that that makes it a command for anybody, other than and, and this is this is I'll put it this way: the passage in in question is Numbers twelve, and it's a criticism of Moses because of the possible it's not definite, but the possible foreign ethnicity of the woman. It actually isn't clear whether this woman is a second wife from Ethiopia, Cush or Moses' original wife, Zipporah, who was from Midian. That's actually not clear. It depends how you understand Cush. So let me let me read a little bit from Milgram's commentary on the book of Numbers. This is the Jewish Publication Society series. Uh, he writes, those who claim that Cush is Ethiopia clearly cannot identify the woman with his wife, Zipporah. They cite an elaborate legend of how Moses had married an Ethiopian. Others, however, place Cush in the Midianite territory based on Habakkuk 3.7. Or understand Cushite as an adjective meaning beautiful, thus allowing for the identification with Zipporah. That the marriage with Zipporah consummated so much earlier, Exodus 2.21, would cause such a belated shock and be explained by the fact that her husband had left her behind when he went to Egypt to redeem his people. And she only rejoined him at Sinai to be seen for the first time by the Israelites in Exodus 18, 5 through 6. So regardless of whether Moses' wife was Ethiopian or Midianite, the objection to her, it is implied, was ethnic. Um, That's the end of the Milgram quote. So there, there is an issue here of when you say who to marry, you were supposed to marry, again, within the tribes of Israel. And so... 
there, there, there could be some issue here with marrying a, either a Midianite, that would be Zipporah, or again, marrying a second woman from Cush, Ethiopia. But whether, whether the Cushite woman is a second wife or not is actually not clear. Our last question is from Elizabeth. As Dr. Heiser reveals the book of Hebrews, Hebrews to us, there came up a discussion in regards to wisdom as feminine. So in Luke 7, 31 through 35, Jesus himself states, quote, but wisdom is vindicated by all her children, end quote. Is it fair to say that Jesus, the son of man, is referring he is one of wisdom's children? Is it possible that the father God and mother wisdom begot the word whom created all things as one of her children? Yeah, I, I would say no. Jesus wasn't spawned by Father God and Mother Wisdom. Uh, for those of you who who this is a, a totally new discussion, you know, wisdom, Lady Wisdom, the Wisdom figure. Uh, I would just suggest you go to www.thedivinecouncil.com. That's my website. And there's a on the right hand side, I have a, a short list of papers that I did on different subjects, and and there's one called Jesus and the Wisdom Figure of Proverbs eight that I'd recommend that you read. You know, back in Proverbs 8 and all the wisdom language of Proverbs, and, uh, there, you know, there's a couple of references in Job as well. This has nothing to do with procreation. Uh, the procreation language is not used in Luke 7. Uh, I'll, I'll read that in a moment. But generally, the, the, this kind of stuff has nothing to do with an actual mother and a father and an actual procreation. Wisdom is referred to as lady wisdom because of grammar. Uh, in, in lots of languages, if you had Spanish or French or German or Latin in high school or Greek or whatever, uh, you know that, that words get genders. They get grammatical genders, and that is to match them up, match up nouns and verbs correctly. Uh, English is not like this. English is a word order driven language. It's not, we don't have endings on our nouns and our verbs necessarily. I mean, you know, there are some exceptions, but we don't, we don't generally have that in terms of how to align correctly for a speaker or a hearer, what nouns go with what verbs. Other languages do, and Hebrew Hebrew does as well. So in, in Hebrew, the word for wisdom, chokmah, is grammatically feminine. So when chokmah is referred to as a person or personified in the literature, the pronouns that are going to go with chokmah, with wisdom, are going to be feminine. Her, hers, you know, she, that sort of thing. And so that's why you, when you read in Proverbs, um, some of the early chapters of Proverbs, and of course, Proverbs 8, pretty much the whole chapter. But it, none of this has anything to do with actual procreation, as, the, as though wisdom was a procreative, uh, capable being, or something like that. Uh, those of you who have followed my content for a while, you know that uh, wisdom for me is, is part of the two Yahweh's uh, phenomenon, that you have two Yahweh figures. And of course, in the Old Testament, you have hints of a third. This is where Trinitarianism actually comes from when you get into the New Testament. And I discussed this, you know, in some detail uh, in, in Unseen Realm, but again, the, the paper at thedivinecouncil.com will cover it more thoroughly. But you have you have a situation here where, you know, you're, you're dealing with, with, with grammar, not with, you know, actual procreation. Now, I'm going to read Luke 7, 31 to 35, just so that listeners can get this in their heads, and then I'll say a few things about it. To what then shall I compare the people of this generation? You know, Jesus is the speaker here. And what are they like? They are like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to one another. We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We sang a dirge, and you did not weep. For John the Baptist has come eating no bread and drinking no wine, and you say, he is a demon. The son of man has come eating and drinking, and you say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. And here's verse 35. Yet wisdom is justified by all her children. So that, that's the passage. I mean, there's no procreation language in there. And scholars are actually disagreed in that passage on whether, on where the line comes from, where, the, where verse 35 comes from. Some think it is part of a, you know, it is alluding to a second temple wisdom text. Because in intertestamental literature, you get plenty of talk about wisdom, you know, the, the lady wisdom figure. Uh, other scholars don't think that Jesus is alluding to a wisdom text in this passage. So there's a disagreement there. 
I think Jesus may be alluding to a, a text known as the Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 7. Uh, I'll, I'll read you verses 22 through 27. This is from the Lexham English Septuagint. Um, and this is about wisdom. So just, just listen and you'll, you'll, at the end of it, there's a phrase that sounds a little bit like Luke 7, 35. So it, there may be a connection, but again, other scholars think that no, he's not actually alluding to this anyway. So the passage reads, for in her, that is in wisdom, is a spirit that is intelligent, holy, unique, manifold, gentle, movable, clear, undefiled, distinctive, invulnerable, loving goodness, sharp, unhindered, beneficent, humane, steady, secure, free from care, all-powerful, overseeing all, and penetrating through all spirits that are intelligent, pure, and gentle. For wisdom is more mobile than any motion, and she pervades and penetrates everything because of her purity. For she is the breath of the power of God and the emanation of the pure glory of the Almighty. Because of this, nothing defiled creeps into her. For she is the brightness of the eternal light and the spotless mirror of the activity of God and the image of his goodness. But although she is one, she is able to do all things. And although she remains in herself, she renews all things. And although she enters into holy souls in all generations, she makes them to be friends of God and to be prophets." Now, it's this last line about making making people friends of God and to be prophets that Jesus might be alluding to this text for. The point would be that wisdom's children in Luke would be the people who are wise and receive Jesus and John the Baptist, not, not Jesus himself. So it, it could be. Um, Fitzmaier writes, this is from Fitzmaier's uh, Luke commentary, He writes, wisdom is here personified in Luke 7. She sends out her messengers like prophets, and they are rejected. See wisdom 727. So he thinks, again, that that last verse has something to do with this. Both John and Jesus arrive as such on the Palestinian scene with a critical eschatological message. And what they announce, heard at first as insane and offensive, turns out to be the mark of wisdom. I mean, in in other words, they're right. The people of this generation, Fitzmaier says, turn out to be not the children of wisdom, but sulking spoil sports who fail to recognize her. So that's the end of the Fitzmaier quote. Um, You know, it could could be, again, like I said, scholars disagree whether that this is part of what's known as wisdom Christology or not um, in this passage. But there's a chance, you know, that, that Jesus could have been alluding to this passage. But if he is, then interpretively, he's referring to negatively. You know, he's using it to take a jab at the people who are rejecting him and you know, John the Baptist. Now, I want to say one more thing. I'm going to go back to this wisdom passage that I read. Uh, verse 26, she is the brightness of the eternal light and the spotless mirror of the activity of God and the image of his goodness. This, this brightness of the eternal light description, this gets picked up in the book of Hebrews for the radiance of the son of Jesus himself. So it would be difficult for Jesus to be spawned by wisdom if Jesus was equated with the wisdom figure elsewhere in the New Testament. Uh, Paul refers to Jesus as the wisdom of God uh, in in one of the Corinthian letters, but Hebrews is the most overt reference because this this word here in, in the Greek text is apagosma, And the only places it's ever found, the only places this word is ever found are in this passage in Wisdom of Solomon and in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. So it's very clear that the writer of Hebrews is is saying that that the Son is this figure. The Son, Jesus, is the wisdom of God. He is the the, the radiance, is is how Hebrews puts it, um, of the glory of God. So that would make it you know, an, an awfully convoluted thing, you know, to to import wisdom back into chapter 7, verse 35, in the sense that of, of spawning Jesus or something like that. Typically, again, those, those of us who, who are into or are interested in wisdom Christology, we typically have the second person of the Godhead that we know as Christians as the Son. The second person of the Godhead in the Old Testament is a figure like the angel of the Lord or wisdom or the word of the Lord, or something like that, um, where, where God shows up in the form of a man, or personified in, in human form generally. So 
you know, by the time you get to the New Testament, that second person of the Trinity has decided, has chosen to become a man incarnate in Christ. So you have you have, you have the second person figure of, of, of the Godhead, and it has Old Testament roots. Again, this I, I argue this at length in Unseen Realm. It has Old Testament roots, but the way it plays out in the New Testament both Im- imbibes, you know, connects back to the Old Testament, and also you have the uniqueness of the incarnation to express it in the New Testament as well. So that that's how I would answer that question. First one's from Ivram. What does Mike think about the name Yahweh in the New Testament? Why is the Tetragrammaton missing from the New Testament? Is the name Yahweh only for the Jews and not meant for all nations? And what does Mike think about the term Hallelujah in Revelation 19.1? Is it considered only for heavenly beings and not for the rest of the church? Yeah, I'll, I'll take the la- that last part first. I see no reason or rationale that the term can't be used by any believer. There's there's no prohibition there. Uh, why isn't the Tetragrammaton in the New Testament? Because the New Testament's written in Greek. It's not written in Hebrew. Now, the, the, the deity name likely is in the New Testament because you have certain, uh, especially in the Gospel of John, I am passages or I am he statements. And that those are those are legitimate translations of the of the tetragrammaton uh, from the Old Testament. So it it actually is there, even though it's not transliterated. So we have to remember just because it it isn't transliterated and it would look like like I A O something like Yao in, in Greek texts that that transliterate the divine name. That's typically how it's rendered, something like that, or Ia. Just because that doesn't show up in the New Testament doesn't mean that it's absent from the New Testament. So you have the I am or the I am he statements that uh, at least some of them in the Gospel of John do directly draw on the divine name. Our next question is from Craig. How did minor prophets become scripture? What is known or theorized for how the minor prophets gain their credibility, their following, in order to be preserved as scripture? Well, I, I would say this first of all, the question is asking me to speculate because we aren't given precise answers to these questions about, you know, how Amos got, got to be known, got to be respected, and so on and so forth. So I'm I'm not going to speculate or guess. There's certainly no historical doubt about the inclusion of Amos in the canon. So it's safe to say the community recognized his status as a prophet. You know, prophets there there's such a thing in the Old Testament called the, you know, some translations actually put it this way, and some scholars put it this way, schools of the prophets. Uh, prophets had followers that would learn for a New Testament equivalent here, like the rabbi master relationship. That was true of prophets as well. They, they would learn, uh, pro- people would follow prophets, learn from their teachers, and they would learn how to preach and how to minister. But again, in, in the academic world, this term is usually employed to describe a prophet's followers who would eventually codify or write down his sermons. In other words, they would; these were the guys who would actually produce the written book that bears the prophet's name. But let, me, let me read one passage in 2 Kings 2.3. This is uh, part of the uh, Elisha story. And it said here, And one of the sons of the prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take away your master from over you? And he said, yes, I know it. Keep quiet. It's a nice verse. Elisha is basically telling him to shut up. Um, But there's this reference to the sons of the prophets. Again, other translations might have something like school of the prophets there. But sons of the prophets doesn't refer to physical offspring. It refers to these groupies, okay, These, these people that would follow the prophets around and listen to them and eventually be responsible for codifying what they preached. Uh, There's another reference in 2 Kings 4.1. Now the wife of one of the sons of the prophets cried to Elisha, Your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that your servant feared the Lord, but the creditor has come to take my two children to be his slaves, so on and so forth. So there you have sons of the prophets. Same thing in the same chapter, 2 Kings 4.38. Elisha came again to Gilgal when there was a famine in the land. And as the sons of the prophets were sitting before him, he said to his servants, set on a large pot and boil stew for the sons of the prophets. Again, there are a number of these references to 
these groups, they're important because we, we could speculate, if we're going to speculate and we have to, that Amos was a member of such a school or such a group of the prophets, and he emerged as a respected speaker that way, despite his vocational occupation as being a, a, a in, in the, let's just put it, in the agrarian industry. You know, that, that didn't so much matter. If he had the time, and again, we're speculating, if he had the time to go follow, the, follow a prophet around or learn from them, he could do that. And again, just emerge from the, from the group of, of those who did and become a prophet himself. All right. Paul has our next question. I just wanted to ask if you think it's possible that the writer of Genesis had the serpent from the Epic of Gilgamesh in mind when writing this account of the fall of man. I would assume that the snake that took the flower plant of eternal life in the Epic of Gilgamesh benefited from its effects. In translations of Revelation 20, verse 2, the serpent from the garden is referred to as the old serpent, which also may lead credence to this idea. Your thoughts? Yeah, Revelation 20, verse 2, you know, would not be an allusion to a Sumerian uh, epic. I mean, it would be, a, it'd be an allusion back to Genesis 3. So we, we have to keep that in mind. But just generally, I think it's possible, but Gilgamesh isn't the only candidate. The Adapa tale, uh, that's A-D-A-P-A, uh, might be a better parallel. Uh, Adapa was the first man in this text. And so there's a story that, again, in, in, involves a serpent figure uh, in that story. So that, that might be what the, the illusion could be to as well, other than Gilgamesh. Uh, I also think, just to be clear, I think that we're dealing with the serpent. We're dealing with, with more than a, a literary illusion. But since the, the question is oriented to the literature, we'll just keep it at that. Um, let me just read a little little section I have here, the Zondervan Illustrated Bible Background Commentary, Z-I-B-B-C, and it has a, a little section on this. It says, in the Gilgamesh epic, after Gilgamesh acquires the magical plant that will rejuvenate him, it is stolen by a snake. In the story of Adapa, one of the guardians of Anu's palace, where Adapa is offered the food of life, is Gizida which equals to Ningish Zeta, Lord of the Productive Tree, quote-unquote. Ningishida is, serp- is serpent-shaped or accompanied by horned serpents, again, depending on the text, and he is guardian of the demons who live in the, in the netherworld. So if you want to make a connection between the serpent figure and a sinister supernatural being, um, Ningishida in the Adapa epic is actually a better candidate. But again, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't rule you know Gilgamesh out as far as an illusion here either. It could could be one of the other or none. It doesn't have to be one of the one of these options, but they're they're definitely possibilities. Mason wonders if you have an opinion on why a fair mm-hmm. amount of translations will not red letter Revelation one verse eight. Well, let's look at Revelation one verse eight here. I'll look it up quickly. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. The verse actually answers your question. Um, It's not red-lettered because the statement isn't from the mouth of Jesus. It's from the mouth of the Lord God. So the the red-letter strategy can't quite cope, or at least it has some difficulty, with instances like this where the line between God and Jesus is so blurred since the, the text explicitly has quote, says the Lord God and not says Jesus, they opt to not make it read, despite the fact that that the description, the Alpha and Omega, will be later applied to Jesus. So again, the the whole red letter strategy has some difficulty here, but that that would be why they do not red letter it. it. The text is very explicit. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God. It doesn't say, says Jesus, or says the Son of God, or something like that. So that's why it's not red letter. Generally, you know, I think red letter editions are a bad idea anyway. You know, the, the words of Jesus aren't any more important than any other words of Scripture. You know, it's, it's not that they're specially inspired and, and the rest of the stuff is lesser inspired. It's all inspired. So, again, I, I, I tend to, to shy away and discourage use of red letter editions, but that wasn't part of the question, so I'll stop there. <laughs> I can see that quote already, Mike. Marshall from Seattle has a question about the reading of Isaiah 40. 
A college professor friend says that he doesn't agree with Dr. Heiser and his case for the Divine Council because, quote, No account is given for the New Testament identifying the voice as John the Baptist speaking to Israel in the wilderness and how that plays into how we then read Isaiah 40. I am uncomfortable having the New Testament give an interpretation of an Old Testament text that is completely different to an interpretation we give that Old Testament text. End quote. What are Mike's thoughts? You know, Mark 1 clearly has the messenger preparing the way of the Lord as John the Baptist. Messengers say things. Messengers speak. So I, I'm not saying that the plural commands of Isaiah 40 are John the Baptist speaking. I've never said that. So I think there's, there's a little bit being misunderstood there. It's God speaking to a group, his divine counsel in Isaiah 40. The commands are all plural. They're not singular. I don't write the text, but I know how to read it. So, you know, there you have it. It's speaking to a group. And John turns out to be the fulfillment in human terms of this divine decree. I mean, that, that's, that's Mark 1. I mean, it's, it's, it's plain as day. But I've, I've never said that, that Mark is mouthing the, the words of Isaiah 40. So let, let's, let's, you know, not make me say things that I don't say. There's nothing unusual with my view either. It's common in scholarship, and many scholars want Isaiah 40 to be a second call narrative. The first one would be Isaiah 6. So a lot lot of them consider Isaiah 40 to be kind of mirroring Isaiah 6 because of the similarities between the two. Uh, But even those who don't say Isaiah 40 is a, a second call narrative, and I'm thinking of somebody like Christopher Seitz here, last name spelled S E I T Z. Even those who don't see it as a second call narrative know that the divine council is present and is oriented there. Now, I've, what, what I've decided to do here in light of this question is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to include Christopher Seitz's article in the protected folder where I upload articles uh, that I mention on the podcast periodically. So if you're a newsletter subscriber um, to the McLaught newsletter, you can get access to this article. But the article is entitled... The Divine Council, Temporal Transition and New Prophecy in the Book of Isaiah. It's a great article. It's pretty awesome. Uh, and it's all about the language of Isaiah 40. It, it, it's somewhat technical, but I don't think you need a, a graduate degree to read through the article and, and appreciate what, what's going on there. Um, but it, it's, it's excellent and establishes very well the presence of the Divine Council there. And there, there, there are other articles, too, that I quote in Unseen Realm. Frank Moore Cross from Harvard years ago did a really nice article on the plural imperatives of Isaiah 40. Uh, among scholars, there's little question here that you have the divine counsel uh, in view. But again, I've never said that, that John the Baptist is going around saying the words of Isaiah 40. He just happens to be the, the way things play out uh, in fulfillment. And if you if you listened at all to our, our series with Matt Halstead on Paul's use of the Old Testament in Romans, you should know very well at this at this time that, you know, oftentimes when the New Testament repurposes the old, you don't get these one to one correspondences. You get thematic or you know topical correspondences, typological correspondences, isn't that? Again, it, you know, we, we don't want to we don't want to press Mark you know, too far. And, and I don't, you know, I've never said John the Baptist is, is, you know, speaking the very words of Isaiah 40. Uh, he just, he just turns out to be the fulfillment of it. He prepares the way for the Messiah. Who else would it be? Uh, again, it's clearly John's role. So I don't, I don't know what the, what the beef is. I would, I would suggest that your professor needs to read and digest cites his article. If he has a problem with the divine counsel part of it, uh, that should cure him. Marshall from Seattle has a, another question, and it is, what is the serpent well in Nehemiah 2.13? Yeah, this one interested me because I've never actually, you know, noticed this in Nehemiah. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not into the geographical features, <laughs> like wells and such of the Holy Land. So I, I went and looked this up in Israel Loken's commentary on Ezra and Nehemiah, and his commentary is from the Evangelical Exegetical Commentary series put out by Lexham Press, which is not only a good series, but this is an excellent uh, commentary on Ezra and Nehemiah. But to, to start off, let me just read Nehemiah 2.13. It says, I went out by night by the valley gate 
to the dragon spring and to the dung gate. And I inspected the walls of Jerusalem that were broken down and its gates that had been destroyed by fire. So this is part of Nehemiah's initial uh, reconnoitering of the situation that he, you know, this journey, you know, back to Jerusalem to fix, you know, to, to rebuild the walls. And he points out a few of these features. So let me read from Loken's commentary. It's kind of lengthy, but it covers a lot of the, the, the bases as far as what this is. He writes, the valley gate was probably located near the southwest corner of the city, opening into the Hinnom Valley, otherwise known as Gehenna. This gate had been fortified by Uzziah in 2 Chronicles 26.9. Allen, a minimalist, locates the valley gate at the midway point of the western wall. According to this view, the valley gate would have opened to the central valley, the Tyropian. A gate has been discovered at about this spot, however, its date is uncertain. According to Kenyon, it may date to the time of Nehemiah. Nehemiah and his men traveled from the valley gate to the refuse gate, a distance of a thousand cubits. That's according to Nehemiah 3.13, about 1,500 feet. The refuse gate, also known as the dung gate, was probably the southernmost gate, leading to the trash dump in the Hinnom Valley. It is probably to be identified as the potsherd gate, mentioned in Jeremiah 19.2. The trash dump outside the refuse gate takes on great theological significance in the New Testament, as it is associated metaphorically with the place of the eternal punishment of the wicked. For example, Matthew 5, 22, 29, and 30, Luke 12, 5, and James 3, 6. As, this, as the group traveled from the valley gate to the refuse gate, it passed by the well of the serpent. This well is also known as the jackal's well or the dragon's well. The Hebrew word can mean serpent, jackal, or dragon. It is possible that the site took its name from the jackals that haunted the Hinnom Valley to consume the dead bodies that were thrown there. Kleins believes the well of the serpent is to be identified with Enrogel. Williamson correctly calls this view most implausible. Braslavi identifies it as the Pool of Siloam, an identification equally unlikely. Another remote possibility is the major spring of Jerusalem, the Gihon. According to this view, the name Well of the Serpent derives from the serpentine course of the waterway, from the spring to the Pool of Siloam, the most probable identification of the king's pool. So, unquote, that's the end of Logan's quote. So there you have it. There are a number of possible locations, uh, possible um, things that could be be identified with this particular gate and, and the well and so on and so forth. But uh, there's, there's a lack of certainty there. But those are all the good possibilities. Well, all right, Mike. Well, why don't we just get through these questions here? That way you can go do something more fun <laughs> than answering our questions. But uh, I, don't, I don't know if I'll have that today, but go ahead. All right. All right. Sounds good. Our first one's from Tim from Hutto, Texas. Uh, he's got two questions. All right. Our first two questions are from Tim from Hutto, Texas. The first one is, when Paul cites the law in 1 Corinthians 14, verses 34 through 35, what is he talking about? Yeah, the short answer is nobody knows for sure, because there, there's not really a clear citation. Um, let me just read read the passage so people know what we're talking about. As in all the churches of the saints, the women should keep silent in the, in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but should be in submission, as the law also says. If there is anything they desire to learn, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is shameful for a woman to speak in the church. Paul doesn't actually cite anything specific from the law here. You know, most think this has something to do with with creation order that he talks about in 1 Corinthians 11. But again, that's a guess. Nobody really knows for sure. A lot of ink has been spilled to explain 1 Corinthians 14, 34, and 35. But you have to, I think you got to give it some thought here. I'll, I'll just tell everybody what my view is here and, and try to make that sensible. It would be utterly incongruent to suppose that Paul was ignorant of women who prophesied in the early New Testament church. We, we have examples of that in Acts 21, verses 8 and 9, with Philip's daughters. Okay, it, if he would have known about Philip's daughters, which we know Paul's been in Jerusalem, okay, couple of times. 
he, he would not be telling women just generally to be silent in the church. He had earlier in this same epistle, 1 Corinthians 11, 5, encouraged women to pray and prophesy. Again, presuming the immodesty situation of chapter 11 was, you know, not what was in check. There's other things to consider, too. The, the early church presumed the events of Pentecost fulfilled Joel chapter 2, verses 28 through 32. And that Joel prophecy included women prophesying, you know, that that was going to happen. So you would expect Paul to be on that side, you know, on the side of women not being silent in church. So another consideration, did Phoebe, a woman commanded or commended by Paul in Romans 16, 1, never speak a word of God in her ministry? I mean, if she was a deacon, which everybody acknowledges she was, because that's what she's called in Romans 16, 1, she would have had to at some point say something in church, you know, to rebuke or admonish or encourage or, you know, do some sort of ministry here. So that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. If Junia, you know, over in Romans 16, 7, was a woman apostle, like akin to what we might call a missionary, then speaking the word of God would be an obvious part of her ministry. So that you have all these things mounting up that Paul would be on the side of, of women speaking. And then you get 1 Corinthians 14, 34 to 35. Now, now, my view is that Paul is talking about something very specific there that he just doesn't relate in the letter. So we don't know. It would have been something that he had in mind that would have been a problem at Corinth, but we just don't know. He doesn't give us the, the description of it. Um, I think that's an, an easy way to reconcile the statement here, to say it was something the Corinthians were doing wrong, uh, and go against all this other data that have Paul encouraging you know, women speaking in church. I think that's, that's an easy way to reconcile. Now, Grudem does something a little bit different. Um, he gets a little more specific. Let me just let me just uh, read what Grudem says. This is from his systematic theology. He has a whole book on prophecy in the New Testament, but this is from his systematic theology. Grudem essentially presumes that what Paul is after is holding in check unauthorized interpretation. So he writes, in this section, Paul cannot be prohibiting all public speech by women in the church. For he clearly allows them to pray and prophesy in church in 1 Corinthians 11.5. Therefore, it is best to understand this passage as referring to speech that is in the category being discussed in the immediate context, namely, the spoken evaluation and judging of prophecies in the congregation. See verse 29, quote, Let two or three prophets speak and let the others weigh what is said, unquote. While Paul allows women to speak and give prophecies in the church meeting, he does not allow them to speak up and give evaluations or critiques of the prophecies that have been given, for this would be a ruling or governing function with respect to the whole church. And Grudem argues for male-governed churches, so that, that, that's why he worded it the way he did there. So to me, this is, a, this is also a possible trajectory, but at the end of the day, I just don't think Paul tells us what what the problem is in 1 Corinthians 14, 34, and 35. And he's, it certainly can't be taken as a blanket statement that women shouldn't speak in church because of 1 Corinthians 11, verse 5, and these other considerations that we talked about. Tim's second question is, I cannot tell you how many times I've heard people tell me the belief that the elements were the actual body and blood of Christ in the Eucharist was universally healed for a thousand years in the early church, or no one believed the Lord's Supper was symbolic in the early church fathers. Is this true? I find myself getting lost in the research. Well, it's not true. I mean, there are, there are going to be people you would find that took, you know, believe that Jesus was talking figuratively, and for good reason. John chapter 6 makes that clear. And even though this is where the, the idea of, you know, eating the, eating the you know, consuming the, the flesh and blood comes from, in that very chapter, there are things said in the chapter that make clear that, that this is a figurative idea. Uh, for example, uh, this is John six thirty. let's see, 33. For the bread of heaven is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. So the bread of heaven is Jesus. Well, we know Jesus isn't a loaf of bread. Jesus wasn't transformed from a loaf of bread or into a loaf of bread. 
Okay, this it, it's obviously figurative language. And verse 34 continues, they said to him, sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. So if we're going to take this literally, that this is the flesh and blood of Jesus, then no Christian should ever be hungry. You should never feel a pang of hunger. You should never, you should never feel thirsty. That's what, the, that's what the scripture says, right? Again, this is obviously figurative language. Uh, Jesus said to them, again, I'm the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. So the issue with taking in the bread of life is belief. Okay, you haven't, when, if Jesus says you haven't eaten yet, okay, means you, don't, you haven't believed yet. You go down to verse 40, this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son, you know, on the bread of life, and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Again, it's very clear what the basis of eternal life is. It's belief, it's faith. It's not taking the elements of the Lord's table. And those elements do not become the literal flesh and blood of Jesus. That's a misreading of John chapter 6. That if we took it to John chapter 6 and tried to be consistent with it, we would see the contradiction. Uh, again, I've just pointed out one or two of them here. So, you know, don't get lost in the research too much. Get lost in John chapter 6, I guess, uh, because that's that's going to be your your main point of correction. Jacob in St. Augustine, Florida, was reading in Leviticus and ran across the term salt of the covenant. After checking the cross-references, I realized it appears three times in Scripture, Leviticus 2.13, Numbers 18, verse 19, and 2 Chronicles 13, verse 5. It appears to have significant, signified both the Mosaic and Davidic covenants. Dr. Heiser talked about the covenant of salt in episode 237 of the Naked Bible Podcast. It seems as if this salt covenant was a binding part of a covenant because salt was valuable, and so the person given salt would be loyal to the salt giver. My question is this, would a salt covenant have been common in the ancient Near East, and is there any more to the analogy than simply salt being valuable and a debt of loyalty from being given salt? Yeah, I actually think that's a, that's a bit over reading of the text. Um, salt was certainly valuable, but to to make it sort of the the glue of the covenant it says you know a little bit too much about it. I'll, I'll just I'll, I'll read you a section from Levine's commentary on Leviticus, Baruch Levine, because it's representative of you know what scholars you know have concluded here. He writes according to priestly law, all sacrifices were to be salted. It's true. In the case of meat. Salt functioned to remove whatever blood remained after the slaughter. The unexpected use of salt in grain offerings is likely a reflection of the overall tendency toward uniformity in ritual. The same general requirement is referred to in Numbers 18.19. In Ezra 6.9 and 7.22, we read that large quantities of salt were delivered to the post-exilic temple of Jerusalem for use in the sacrificial cult. So let's just, I'll just stop there. It's evident that the salt is used to soak up the blood because you weren't supposed to consume the blood. So it's a way of drying out the meat, whether it's going to be preserved and eaten later, you know, in some circumstance, or again, just for the ritual itself. It was not supposed to have blood in it. These are generalities. You can go, go back through the Leviticus series for more nuancing. Um, so that was the function of salt. And you, you wouldn't truck in large quantities. You wouldn't truck in anything as in have trucks then, but pardon the expression. You wouldn't bring in large quantities of salt to the temple if salt was there to signify a covenant. What are they doing? Making covenants every 10 minutes there? No, that wasn't the point of the salt. The point of the salt was for sacrifice, which they did do every day at the temple. And so they had this need, again, to, to get the blood out of them out of the sacrifice. So uh, in that respect, it, it's important, but you're only going to have this require, you're only going to have this requirement if there's some sort of rule against consumption of blood, which there was, or if, you know, part of the sacrifice is to be preserved. 
beyond that, I'm not an expert in ancient Near Eastern meat sacrifice rules. So I, I, I'm not going to venture beyond that. But that much, I think, is, is pretty evident and helps to answer the question. Cody has our next question. Genesis 2 verse 4 refers to the genealogical annuals of the heavens and the earth. The Hebrew term here, toledot, is used nine times in the Old Testament, and it seems in every single occasion the word is used about actual genealogies of a person. But how can the heavens have a genealogy or generations? How in the world can the heavens and the earth have children? Yeah, well, some would would go from this point and talk about Genesis as hiding some sort of procreational language about the the planets, you know, the outer planets and so on and so forth. First of all, then what you're you're basing your your conclusion on something that isn't in the text because it's so well hidden, nobody can see it. So it's a bit of special pleading there. There's nothing in the the text of Genesis to indicate that uh, you have the the birthing of of stars and, and, you know, like, like other deities, you know, named after stars or anything like that. Because none of it's given in the text. It's just a, it's literally an idea inserted into the text and then believed by some people. So we're not in the habit here of just inserting ideas into the text and then believing them and then saying that's what the text is really about uh, when you can't you can't actually read it in there. So that that's one thing I would say. I mean, there's there's very little said at all about creating the celestial objects. You have Genesis one sixteen that uh, the stars were created also, the light bearers, you know, the light reflectors, so on and so forth, which would include planets. But, you know, you don't don't have anything very specific. You don't have any planetary names, for instance. You know, and since these names, you know, like the Jewish month names were adaptations of deity names brought from Babylon. And you can, you know, you you could Google that and find that out in just a minute. That on the way back from Babylon, one, you know, one of the things that culturally the Jews brought with them was uh, names, names of the month, you know, updated and taken from the, you know, Babylonian language, Aramaic that they were speaking. And you have these deity names. So, you know, nobody was ashamed of that. Nobody was ashamed to have those names later in the biblical text. So there wouldn't have been a problem here if, if, if the point of Genesis and it's it's generations, it's Toledot, uh, were to were to, you know, teach the idea of, of God creating the other gods and the stars and stuff like that. There'd be no reason to not put that in there if that was the point. But it's not in there. So I, we can't say it is the point. Uh, I'm with the majority here of interpreters who say the only reason you get this language of of the heavens and earth is to create symmetry in the Genesis account. In other words, it is used everywhere else of every other generation. And so the first you know, generation, the, the initial creation itself, the writer uses the same term to link it to all the other ones, you know, link it in succession. So I think it's about uh, symmetry of the passage and you know, nothing theological or anything like that. Greg Smith from Des Moines, Iowa, asks, Dr. Heiser often talks about the peer review process. How exactly does that does this work? For example, a scholar writes an article for journal publication. Is the article sent to peers prior to publication, or is peer response to the article after publication? The article is sent around to peers prior to publication. That's how it gets reviewed. So, for instance, if I wanted to write an, an article for some scholarly journal, first thing I do is look up the rules for submission, and everybody has rules of submission you know, how many words you're allowed and, you know, use this abbreviation system, so on and so forth. Everybody has their rules. And then you write the article and you submit it, you know, to wherever they tell you to send it. And from that point on, it's out of your hands because what's going to happen to it is it'll get sent to two or three scholars in in the the relevant fields. The editor is going to determine, you know, who to ask, you know, to read this particular article, this particular submission. So it's going to get sent to two or three people for review, and the review is anonymous. In other words, when I've done this, I've gotten back reviewers' comments, but I'll, I don't know who they are. They're just 
just Word docs sent through the editor's email. So I have no idea who the, who the person is that reviewed any particular article of mine. And then the reviewer, in the, in the process of the review, will we'll put notes in there, so, you know, suggesting things that uh, maybe, you know, you know you, this needs a little work. Maybe this needs a little bit more of a t- more attention. You know, include this, but don't include that. Uh, so they they'll render their their opinion and their advice on the article, and then at the end of it, they'll they'll tell the um, the editor if they recommend it for publication or not. And then you'll ultimately hear from the editor, you know, that your article was accepted or not. And you know, typically with an idea of when it would appear in the publication. So that that's how it works. You don't you don't know who your reviewers are. They they probably you know don't even know you or know who you are. I mean, depending on the journal, the chances of that it could be good. And so it's an anonymous process, and your your work has to be approved by field experts to be worthy of inclusion in the journal. In other words, so this is worth reading. This is something worth reading on this given subject. So that that's how they determine it. Joe in Florida has our last question. Is there any significance to the nation that Abraham was called out of in relationship to the Table of Nations? Well, it's not clear to me which nation he's thinking about here, but I'm going to guess that he means Ur of the Chaldeans. I, again, I'm, I'm not sure. So if, if my guess is correct, then the question is, was there any significance to Ur of the Chaldeans uh, to have Abraham called out of that place? And I would say the answer to this is basically the same no matter what view of Ur of the Chaldeans you take. Um, if you think it's, you know, the city of Ur in southern Babylon, well, then, the, you know, obviously the reason that it's noteworthy is that it's a re- there's a reversal of all that is Babylonish to, to the writer and to the readers, the original readers. Babylon was the place that, that chaos erupted. Seen especially in Genesis 11, you know, with the Tower of Babel incident, but also, you know, if you factor in ancient Near Eastern material that could be behind the flood stories and the creation stories, you're also going to going to be, you know, imbibing into a Babylonish context there, and so the chaos elements of some of those things are going to be associated with Babylon too. So to have Abram selected out of Babylon. Uh, there in the south would be significant. God is going to take somebody out of the realm of chaos to fix the chaos. And that's ultimately what this, the story of Scripture is about, what happens to Abraham's seed, who ultimately is Christ. So that would that's why it would be significant. If if you believe that that Ur is not ba- you know, Babylon in the south, but in northwest Mesopotamia near Haran, reasons why that might be the case. Again, you, I've blogged about this on my website before. You could Google Abraham location or and you're going to find it and put in, put in my, uh, my website address as part of the search terms. Uh, you'll find it. But if you believe it's, it's in the Northwest, well, then the, the reversal is a little bit different. Uh, this is going to be the region from which the Amorites were associated. Uh, the Amorites are pre-Israelite you know, they become the pre-Israelite occupants of the promised land, those who are to be driven out, among whom are Nephilim, and so on and so forth. You would have to review the view the reversal of Abraham's circumstance in that in in that context, more of a, a reversing of the conquest of the land by these peoples, who ultimately, yeah, ultimately they're associated with Babylon as well. You know, because later dynasties in Babylon tried to link themselves up with the the old original Amorite diamond dynasty. Uh, Hammurabi's dynasty is is the most famous for this. But Nebuchadnezzar again tried to mimic, you know, the the old Amorite kings and so on and so forth wanted to be part of the Amorite tradition. Uh, so the the Babylonian stink is going to be on on this idea no matter, you know, what what point of you know, what geographical point of or, origin you opt for. There's going to be this notion of reversing Babylon and what it stood for and, and how people thought about it with, you know, God is going to act through one man, Abraham, and he's going to do things that will reverse the chaos caused by this other place. And so, you know, there's there's something, you know, there's a cosmic reversal going on there. All right, Mike. Well, why don't we just jump in here with Nathan 
And Nathan was trying to see if he had any information on Joshua 10. When Joshua prays that God would stop the sun, there seems to be lots of debate on this, and I have come across John Walton's view that it may be related to ancient Near Eastern astrological omen text. I'm not a scholar and cannot seem to find enough resources to determine if this view is accurate in the ancient Near Eastern context, or if it's just speculative. Have you heard of this idea, and can you shed some light on it? Yeah, I've heard of it. It it, it is speculative, but other things that, that could be said about it would be speculative as well uh, about other interpretations. So it, it, it's certainly possible this could be related to some sort of omen language. Uh, for those who are interested in, um, Walton does have an article uh, entitled Joshua 10, 12 through 15 and Mesopotamian Celestial Omen Texts. And it's in the book titled Faith, Tradition, and History, Old Testament Historiography in its Ancient Near Eastern Context. And that's edited by Millard, Hoffmeyer, and Baker. Um, so if, if you had that resource, you could go look up the article. This is one option, again, that, that may, maybe there's some kind of omen that, that, that Joshua is praying for, that you know, the Lord would do something. And whether that means it's an eclipse or you know some other celestial phenomenon, you know we we have to speculate. So that that's the speculative part of it. There are there are texts like texts of this nature, where some military context will be calling for a celestial omen, you know, to favor or you know go against the enemy and, and stuff like this. So there's certainly there's certainly a parallel context for it, but. There's probably not enough you know, in, in Joshua itself to make that correlation secure, but it, it can certainly be argued for. It's, it's, it's a possibility. An, another possibility is to argue that this it's not necessarily a, an omen text or anything like this, but it is a prayer against, against the you know, foreign gods, the gods of Canaan. And this is usually defended on the basis of Habakkuk chapter 3. So in Habakkuk 3, we read, God, this, I'll start in verse 3. God came from Tuman, and the Holy One from Mount Paran. His splendor covered the heavens, and the earth was full of his praise. His brightness was like the light. Rays flashed from his hand, and there, there he veiled his power. Now this is a key, a key verse here. Before him went pestilence, and plague followed at his heels. So the word pestilence in that verse, this is verse 5, is Dever. And the word translated plague that follows it is Reshef. Dever and Reshef are also names of ancient Canaanite deities. So you, you could have this idea here of these other deities following at the heels of Yahweh, you know, like, you know, like whimpering puppies or whatever. Verse 6 says, He, Yahweh, stood and measured the earth. He looked and shook the heavens. Then the eternal mountains were scattered. The everlasting hills sank low. His were the everlasting ways. I saw the tents of Kushan and affliction. The curtains of the land of Midian did tremble. Was your wrath against the rivers, O Lord? Was your anger against the rivers? Or your indignation against the sea when you rode on your horses and your chariot of salvation? Let me just stop there. This is verse 8. Rivers is Nahar. And C is the word Yam. Both of these are also Canaanite deities. Verse 9, you strip the, the sheath from your bow, calling for many arrows. You split the earth with rivers. The mountains saw you and writhed, and raging waters swept on. The deep gave forth its voice and, its, and lifted its hands on high. And here's verse 11. The sun and moon stood still in their place. At the light of your arrows, they sped at the flash of your glittering spear. We'll just stop there. So there's this reference to the sun and moon standing in, in their place amidst this other part of this poem in Habakkuk 3 that have the gods of Canaan in subservient roles, lesser roles, the lesser status than, than the God of Israel, than Yahweh. The whole point of this teaching is that is that forces of plague and pestilence and whatever else these gods are supposed to be ruling over, they don't actually have these powers. These powers belong to Yahweh. So the, these gods are shown to be in submission um, to Yahweh in, in this passage. And there, there are other passages like this, too, in the Old Testament. 
where some other foreign god is cast in, in a in a subservient subservient light. I think that's the best way to put it. Um, so if this is if this is true with these other deity names, plague, pestilence, rivers, sea, you know, Yam, Nahar, Dever, you know, Reshef. If if it's true here, if this is how to read the text here, that this is essentially a statement of, of spiritual superiority, then maybe when in verse 11 in Habakkuk, he gets to the sun and the moon standing place. Maybe that's to mark out Shemesh or Shapesh, deity name, also the word for the sun, and Yareak or Yarik, also a deity name. So maybe maybe what Joshua is, is praying for in Joshua chapter 10 is for God to have victory over the other gods of Canaan and not liter- literally stop the sun and the moon. So again, this is how the, the, the viewpoint is argued on the basis of Habakkuk 3, this parallel text. It seems pretty clearly parallel. Uh, sun and moon, you know, right there. This is how the, the, this viewpoint is typically argued for, uh, as opposed to something astronomical. And, but, you know, Walton's other idea of celestial omens, just you know, more broadly, could also be in view, too. But again, these are, these are speculations. And you'd have to judge which ones are more textually rooted than others. You know, you know God can certainly do what he wants in the physical world. Uh, but is that the right way to read Joshua 10? You know, again, there's, there's disagreement there, as, as the questioner noted. Rose in Minnesota has a question about the prosperity and faith teachings. What are your thoughts on the idea that we only need faith that God will heal us to get healing or that he will provide for all our needs, that he will give us prosperity as we have faith in him? Yeah, I don't think very much of it. Um, as, As far as them wanting, you know, as far as you might want to know, what, what what do they do with passages like First Timothy five twenty three, where Paul Paul can't heal Timothy. He knows Timothy has a problem with his stomach. He tells him to take some wine for his stomach's sake. Paul couldn't heal himself, you know, from the the, the thorn in the flesh. He has to ask three times, and of course the answer was no. On each of those those cases. You know, if if we were all all automatically healed by the work on the cross, then these passages shouldn't even come up. You know, Paul should never have have been afflicted, you know, with a thorn in the flesh. Timothy should never have gotten sick. Nobody should ever get sick. You know, no Christian because we're already healed. Well, again, I think that's nonsense. I think it's it's really over reading the passage. You know, the healing in passages like Isaiah, by his stripes we are healed is metaphorical and, and spiritual. You know, there, there's, there's no rule against using words like healing to speak metaphorically, metaphorically or figuratively. And that's what's going on here. Again, what a, you know, when Jesus runs into people who are, you know, are sick, you know, he, he doesn't, he doesn't, not only doesn't he heal them all, but he never accuses them of doing something wrong. You know, as as to why they're sick, there may be one or two cases where you you know what he says to them, you might wonder, but he just he heals people. He doesn't blame them, you know, for for their situation, or he doesn't promise that once I die, everybody's going to get healed. Not nothing of the sort. So I, I think it's really dramatically overreading the text. If you think about it in real life, then this this means that no Christian should ever be able to break a bone. No Christian should ever you know, suffer the loss of an eye or a limb or a single, you know, digit on the, on the finger. That doesn't make any sense. That, that, that's like if I accidentally saw off my finger, it's going to grow back because I'm a Christian. By his stripes, I'm healed. You know, again, I, I think very little of word of faith and, and these, these kinds of teachings because they're, they're demonstrably unscriptural and, and they're, you know, in some cases, they're just downright wacky. That, and that they're, they're demonstrably untrue by real life. So beyond that, you know, again, I, can't, I, I don't think I'd have it. I'd probably get a little meaner. I don't want to get mean here. But uh, again, I think this is very misleading and, and harms people. Gary asks, do demons or spiritual beings have the power to put thoughts into believers' minds? 
Yeah, we don't have much to go on here. This is actually somewhat discussed in my demons book. I have a little in in the Q and A in the demons book. There's a question there about can demons read minds, um, and that question. I'm just gonna. I'll just I'll just go read what I what I put there because it'll segue into this. Uh, the question about whether demons can read minds usually arises from presumptions we have about consciousness relationship to beings. The fact that angels appear to be one twenty, Matthew two thirteen and nineteen Acts ten verse three, seems to suggest that supernatural beings can tap into one's mind. The assumption is that since evil spirits are fallen angels, then Satan and demons have the ability to occupy space in the human mind. That angels in the New Testament instructed people through such means is not evidence of mind reading, though. So I don't think they can read minds. But if anything, such incidents describe the transmission of information, not reading minds. Such incidents could, of course, influence human behavior and might conceivably be a line of demonic oppression. So, you know, I, I think, is it, is it possible for Satan or a demon to put something in, into, into somebody's mind? I think the answer to that is yes. Um, you know, dreams would, would be a peripheral way of illustrating that. But having said that, having, having at least allowed it for angels, there is no scriptural example of Satan or an evil spirit appearing to somebody in a dream. Okay, as such, it's impossible to make a scriptural statement for some sort of demonic influence over the mind. I mean, it, it, again, this is all you've got, which isn't much. You know, that, that angels can can influence people through their mental states, including sleep. But does that mean that Satan and demons do that? Are they allowed to do that by God? We don't have any indication that that God does allow it. We know that on the you know, for the other side, the angels, this is possible. So maybe it's possible for them, you know, to, to influence people this way, or, or maybe this is part of possession or oppression or something like that. But we're just not told, so we have very little to go on here. Leroy watched a video that Dr. Heiser did concerning the post-Christian future. In that video, he eloquently showed, using biblical texts, how the Apostle Paul called the gospel a mystery because it was hidden from them. My question is, does Isaiah 9 verse 6 describe Jesus and also Isaiah 52 with emphasis on verse 14? Yeah, I think I think it does. Um, I think both those verses do describe the suffering Messiah, who is Jesus, and the reigning Messiah, who is Jesus. That would be Isaiah 9, 6. I don't think there's much of a relationship between them, but... Yeah, I, I I do think that this is the case for both of them. So I'm not sure that that seems to be the only question that was asked here. Um, so I'll just leave it at that. Adam has our last question. In Colossians 1 verse 20, Paul says God was pleased through him, Jesus, to reconcile everything to himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. We know that humanity has been offered reconciliation on earth, but what things in heaven is he talking about reconciling? Yeah, this is actually in the angels book. Um, this is why the books are written, so that you know, we can cover questions like this at length. But let me, just, let, me, let me just pull a few things out for the sake of this episode. Most scholars would acknowledge that all things, whether on earth or in heaven, in, in Colossians, in this verse, in verse 20, includes the heavenly host. Okay, this is usually where this comes up in the, in, in the question. So in light of that assumption, the issue that requires consideration is the meaning of reconcile and making peace through the cross. Most readers presume that this language refers to the forgiveness of sins, but that is not necessarily the case and really not the case here. This comes up when, when I get the question, can fallen angels be redeemed? The answer to that is no, according to Hebrews 2. And I don't think that's contradicted by Colossians 1.20. You have to read in the idea of forgiveness of sins to reconciliation, which in some contexts may be in view and other contexts is not in view. The idea of reconciliation is multifaceted. For example, 
The work of Christ here in Colossians 1 is connected to the renewal of creation, you know, and in other passages. That has nothing to do with forgiveness of sins. The creation didn't sin. Okay, the planet didn't sin. So the reconciliation talked about there is, it has nothing to do with forgiveness of sins. So that, that's just a way of pointing out that the, 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 the terminology itself has no inherent relationship to the forgiveness of sins. You know, healing some moral offense or, or you know, whatever. If we take a look at the verse in Greek, again, I'm trying to skip around through what I have in the, in the book here. The, the, the book does this much better than I'm doing it here. In Colossians 1.20, you have through him to reconcile, and, and the verb form is aorist, to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace. And there, and there you have another aorist, participle in this case, by the blood of his cross. Aorist tenses for verbal forms in Greek. We have an infinitive here and a participle in this verse. Those grammatically have to do with completed time or past time, not to time in progress or time, a time yet unfulfilled. It has nothing to do with the future. So really, this is the verse is saying that through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, having made peace. I mean, this is already a reality by the blood of his cross. What you're going to find out is this reconciliation talk, again, if you read what I have in the book here, is part of the already but not yet. This is already true, but not yet. Um, and it has to do with wider creation. I will read one quotation from one scholar here. It says, uh, the Greek ace autan to him here does not indicate the completion of imminent reconciliation, and thus does not indicate a futuristic occurrence. The expression which is construed in the aorist tense, all things are reconciled with him, is to be interpreted as a parallel construction to the expression in stanza, in stanza 1, that's Colossians 1.16. All things were created in him, you know, were created in him. It's, it's past tense idea. Uh, let's see here. Accordingly, reconciliation has its foundation in the creation and is now arriving at its completion in the dominion of the Son over all things. The point is that the statements in Colossians 1.16, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, must be understood in tandem with Colossians 1.20, through him to reconcile himself all things, whether on heaven or on earth. Both statements are in the same paragraph unit, and both you know, the verbs are in aorist tense, the Greek tense which focuses on completed action, not action in process, or action yet unaccomplished. Therefore, the reconciliation of Colossians 1.20, which we haven't defined yet, is rooted in creation, and now, after the cross, is moving toward its consummation which is excel, itself expressed as the dominion of the Son over all things. So, you know, again, I discussed this at length in the book, but basically what, what's in view in Colossians 1.20 is a cosmic reset back to the original creation of all things, both in, in heaven and on earth. In other words, when, when the, the, the new earth is consummated, when everything is, you know, said and done and, and you know, the the future heaven, okay, heaven on earth, the new earth uh, is here and has been realized. That state, again, is going to be just like, you know, Eden was, both in terms of of the physical earth and also in terms of things invisible, which would include the heavenly host. There's going to be no rebellion. Okay? There's going to be no, you know, no sin, no rebellion. It's going to, again, be restored to a pristine Edenic state. And that's what the reconciliation is about. It's not about the forgiveness of either angel sins or the earth sins. And one is denied by Hebrews too, and the other one makes no sense because the earth is an inanimate object. Again, so that, that's really what it's referring to when, when you get to the, the things invisible. It's the, heaven, the heavenly host, but the idea is that the heavenly host is restored to what it, it originally was before there was any rebellion. So it's not talking about restoration or forgiveness, because again, that's specifically denied in Hebrews 2. Jesus became a man 
to affect the plan of salvation. He didn't become an angel. The incarnation is linked specifically and intrinsically to the plan of redemption. The incarnation, it's for humans, you know, not uh, for non-humans. It's for his human images, not the other ones. But anyway, uh, the point is reconciling all things, whether in heaven or on earth. In Colossians 1.20, refers to the restoration of creation, order, and authority just generally. Our first question, question is from Peter. I've been bothered by the Second Kings 10 and Hosea 1, verses 4 through 5 subject matter. It would seem by these passages that God ordered King Jehu to commit genocide, only to condemn the commanded action as murder. Is there an apparent solution to this dilemma? Well, yeah, there is. Uh, First of all, I would say that targeting Baal worshippers among your countrymen is not genocide. So that's a misuse of that term. Genocide is extermination based on ethnicity. Clearly, that is not the motivation here. You know, and, and more broadly, God decides when to punish the heinous crimes of Ahab and Jezebel and the rest of the Baal worshiping lot with them, which was substantial. And that's God's choice. He gets to decide when and how evil, especially this ultra low sort of evil, gets, you know, gets punished. So it, it's his prerogative. We don't tell God how to do his, you know, his job. If, if anything, we, we avoid taking vengeance, you know, to ourselves. It's the old vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And so when God does that, it's a little, it's basically wrongheaded for us to sit in judgment on God as to how God decides to do things. When, you know, their interaction with the prophets, you know, shows that they could have, they could have repented. They could have, you know, stopped worshiping Baal. They could have done all those things, but they don't. Now, as far as the bigger or the, or the more specific question, I'm going to read, uh, an extended portion here from uh, Gleason Archer's book. It's a reference book. And, I, and I'm only doing this because you know, I, I want to make the point to, to listeners that if, if you're going to be serious about Bible study, you must start investing in tools. You can't depend on a podcast. You can't depend on Mike uh, to answer these questions. There are lots of tools out there that specifically address questions like this. They're they're compendium volumes of these sorts of things. So this one is Gleason Archer, the New International Encyclopedia of Bible Difficulties, published by Zondervan. And, and this goes back to 1982. And at, at the end of this, I'll mention a few more. But you need to start investing in tools. Uh, that, that's why they're published. That's why they're put out there, these reference works that can really help you. So Archer, or whoever did the article, writes, There can be no question that Jehu fully carried out the commission he received from the Lord. You shall strike the house of Ahab, your master, that I may avenge the blood of my servants, the prophets, and the blood of all the servants of the Lord at the hand of Jezebel, for the whole house of Ahab shall perish, unquote. That's 2 Kings 9, 7 through 8. It very clearly has nothing to do with genocide. After Jehu racing back from the whole, from, from remote Gilead to Jezreel, He shot King Jehoram dead, and Ahaziah of Judah as well, for he was the grandson of Jezebel. He then proceeded to the city of Samaria and intimidated the elders of that city into decapitating all 70 of Ahab's sons who were living in the palace, 2 Kings 10, 1 through 10. Not long after that, he managed to lure all the Baal-worshipping leaders of Israel into the temple of Baal on the pretext of leading them in a great celebration of worship there. Once they were locked up inside the temple itself, he had them all massacred by his troops and destroyed the entire building, desecrating it in such a way that it could never be used for worship again. It's verses 18 through 27. It was after Jehu had carried out all these stern measures for the suppression of idolatry in Israel that the commendation came to him from the Lord. Quote, because you have done well in executing what is right in my eyes and have done to the house of Ahab according to all that was in my heart, your sons of the fourth generation shall sit on the throne of Israel, unquote, at 2 Kings 10.30. But 2 Kings 10.33 indicates that even before that invasion by Assyria in the 21st year of Shalmaneser, which would have been about 832 B.C., 
Jehu had lost all Transjordan, Manasseh, Gad, and Reuben, which later had for the most part been conquered by Moab under King Mesha, to King Hazael of Damascus. His son Jehoahaz was reduced to complete vassalage by Hazael and his son Ben-Hadad, but Jehoash was allowed by the Lord to expel the Syrians in three decisive engagements and also to crush the pretensions of King Amaziah of Judah in the Battle of Beth Shemesh, with a resultant spoilation of, his, of Jerusalem itself. But it was Jehu's great-grandson Jeroboam II who achieved very great success on the battlefield, for he regained possession of the Transjordan tribal territory and all the area formerly ruled over by Jeroboam I, just as the prophet Jonah had predicted. On what basis, then, did the prophet Hosea proclaim the judgment of the Lord on the dynasty of Jehu in Hosea 1, 4 through 5? It was because of the impure motive with which Jehu himself had carried out his commission from Yahweh to blot out the line of Ahab. Although Jehu had only done what God had commanded, he did so out of a carnal zeal that was tainted with protective self-interest. Second Kings 10.29 says of him, quote, However, as for the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, by which he made Israel sin, from these Jehu did not depart, even the golden calves that were at Bethel and Dan, unquote. Let me just stop there. For you to conclude that, that God is judging Jehu for the same thing that he commanded him to do, which he did, would be to would be to interpret that verse or those verses as only including what happened there with Jehu in that one instance. Whereas the statement is much broader as for the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which he made Israel to sin from these Jehu did not depart. Jehu's clearly got bigger problems. He's got other spiritual defects other than carrying out this command, um, you know, from back in 2 Kings 10. So that's why he's condemned. He's not condemned for the 2 Kings 10 incident or the material. He was obedient there. He's he's condemned for the places he's not obedient. Follows in the way of Jeroboam, you know, the first. Uh, Back to the paragraph. This same mixture of motives showed up in in Jehu's descendants as well. For Jehoahaz, quote, did evil in the sight of the Lord and followed the sins of Jeroboam, unquote. Jehoash, Jehoash's son, or Jehoahaz's son, did not do much better, for he followed his father's evil example, 2 Kings 13, 11. Even though he did retain a respectful relationship with the prophet Elisha, 2 Kings 13, 14 through 19. And even though Jeroboam II enjoyed such remarkable success in war and had a long reign of 41 years, in other words, from 793 to 782 as viceroy under his father, and 782 to 753 B.C. as sole king. Yet his relationship toward the Lord was no better than his father's. Quote, he did evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not depart from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, with which he made Israel sin. Unquote. It's verse 24. So the reason that they're condemned is because they don't depart from the sins of Jeroboam not because he got rid of Ahab. Again, it it seems pretty clear on this end. The important principle set forth in Hosea 1.4 was that when blood is shed, even in the service of God and in obedience to his command, blood guiltiness attaches to God's agent himself if his motive was tainted with carnal self-interest rather than by a sincere concern for the purity of the faith and the preservation of God's truth, such as, for example, animated Elijah, when he had 450 prophets of Baal put to death after the contest with them on Mount Carmel. The bloodshed of Jezreel was finally visited on the house of Jehu with his great-great-grandson Zechariah, being murdered at his own birthday party by his trusted chariot captain Shalom in 2 Kings 15.10. So again, what they're condemned for is following in the sins of Jeroboam not for obeying God back in 2 Kings 10. Other resources besides Archer. Again, you must invest in tools. Uh, You shouldn't be dependent on on asking uh, other people questions like this when they're they're fully fully answerable. 
uh, by reference works. Here, other than this one, this was this was Gleason Archer. I'll repeat the title. Gleason Archer, New International Encyclopedia of Bible Difficulties. Here are, here are a few others. Here's David O'Brien, Today's Handbook for Solving Bible Difficulties. Here's a book by Norman L. Geisler and Thomas Howe, When Critics Ask, a popular handbook on Bible difficulties. Walt Kaiser and a few other authors. It's really, by now, there, there were several books, but they've been collected into one volume. Hard Sayings of the Bible. That's by InterVarsity Press. And Murray Harris has one called Navigating Tough Texts, A Guide to Problem Passages in the New Testament. So there you have five reference works that are all worth getting for questions like these. Peter's second question is concerning the association of Tarshish with Spain. The last I knew Tarshish was only known as part of the Western Mediterranean speculated as anywhere between Spain and Sardinia. Has a definitive association been made? What about Ophir? Yeah, the, the best resource for this I'm just going to direct you to, and I've, I've sent this to Trey, and it, it's on the episode website. There's an article by John Day on where was Tarshish. Uh, it's from Day's collection of essays on Genesis 1 through 11. And it's the most thorough treatment of the location of Tarshish and identifying it with, with Spain. So I would just recommend to read that. I can't very well read, you know, 12, 13 pages of explanation uh, on the podcast. Our next question is from Patrick. I was listening to the Naked Bible podcast regarding the responsibility of the watchers for human sin. Your point was humans are capable of creating their own sin. My question is, what about organized evil in the world? I'm talking about satanic ritual abuse victims. It seems to me that there are two kinds of sin, sort of. Garden variety, and then there is the very deliberate, destructive enterprise. That's a bit of a generous view of sin. (laughs) But, you know, satanic ritual abuse is still human evil. Humans are the ones perpetrating it. So you can't really answer a cosmic question if, if that's what is behind this question. I'm not actually sure. You can't really answer a cosmic question by reasoning backwards from a, a heinous example of human evil. In this case, maybe maybe they're, they're sincere Satanists. Maybe they're worshiping Satan, worshiping the creature more than the creator. But SRA can be rooted a lot more in the flesh than that. Uh, programming is the worst form, but but that's all about gaining power over other people to serve your own ends. It's still human, uh, perhaps involving humans being deceived by a supernatural evil power. That's certainly possible. But that doesn't answer what sounds to me like a where did evil come from question, uh, or you know what, what would have prompted evil in the first place. Uh, if, if that's the question, then I'd say the root is the hunger for autonomy. Uh, rebellion and resistance to a, a authority and any any authority, all authority in the extreme. Dick in Stephenville, Texas, asks, Has anyone written a paper on the possibility that Gabriel was the father of Jesus and that his powers were the result of being a Nephilim? I don't believe this, but I see how it could be argued, seeing that he is such a part of the birth stories. If it is not an issue, I don't want to make it one. Well, I'm, I'm relieved to hear that you don't believe this because it's theologically absurd. It's also textually indefensible. You know, Gabriel, his name is Gabriel. Get, you know, it comes from Geber, which is related to Gibor, but not every Gibor was a giant. David is called a Gibor. God is called a Gibor. In Isaiah 9, wonderful counselor and mighty God, it's El Gibor. So the, the, the fact that you have Gibor Gever language doesn't mean at all that you're looking at Nephilim. So that's the, that's the exegetical problem. But the theological problem is much worse. I mean, you look at all the passages that point to Jesus' pre-existence. You look at a passage like Hebrews 1, for instance, again, arguing very clearly for he, pre-existence, Philippians chapter 2. Jesus was not fathered by anything or anyone. So nobody's written a paper on this because it's so theologically indefensible. That's how I would answer the question. 
Taylor asks, do you think the nations will be reclaimed and the Great Commission will succeed within human history? Or do you think that the nations will only be reclaimed after Jesus' second bodily coming? Well, the Lord's return will close the door on the Great Commission and lead to the destruction of the spiritual powers over the nations. And then, of course, the submission of the nations under Christ and their conversion. So as precipitate on the return, that's a little better way of saying I'm millennialist, because I'm not. Um, I don't think post-millennialism makes a whole lot of sense uh, in, in light of a lot of other things that are said about reclaiming the nations. It's triggered on the second coming. We don't reclaim them for Jesus, and then Jesus comes back and says, thank you. I mean, a, a lot of this work is going to depend on him and his return. Jason was wondering, I've heard you mention several times other ancient writings like the Ugaritic texts, etc., and how there's some similarities to the biblical text in some areas. A question is, do these other ancient texts lay out civil laws, relational laws to God and man, prohibitions against human sacrifice? Do they aim to bring light and order to chaos, or do they just convolute things? Do the other ancient texts prescribe or encourage sexual worship practices? Do they prescribe child sacrifice? It seems like although there are many, there may be some similarities between the Hebrew scriptures and other ancient texts. Only the Bible brings light, love, and relationship to God. What do you say? Well, there are a lot of law codes. You know, when you say, when you ask, do ancient texts lay out civil laws? The answer is, of course, and there's a lot of them. Uh, people are living in civilizations. They're living in cultures with lots of other people. Tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of people. You have to have a legal system for that to be at all workable. You have to have authority and hierarchy and, and laws and such, and your crime and punishment. So there's a lot of law code material in the ancient Near East. But that's, that's very general. You, you mentioned relational laws about God to man. If, if you mean laws against blasphemy, yeah, those existed in other, other ancient law codes. People took the worship of their gods seriously, and they don't want their gods' property defiled or their sacred space defiled and so on and so forth. They don't want their gods blasphemed in their in their religion, their religious system. So, there, yeah, there's going to be laws there, too. There's going to be laws that separate priesthood from temple and common person from sacred space and all that. Human sacrifice, that was rare in antiquity. It was actually quite rare. Um, some, some places practiced it occasionally. It's not like the Aztecs, okay? We, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't be equating like the, the Carthaginians or the Phoenicians, you know, with, with what the Aztecs were doing. But, but it did happen. Um, and I don't think the scale is quite the same. But that's just one culture. You know, other cultures would have found this abhorrent and would not have done it. And so I, I don't, I, I'm not a, I don't have ancient law codes memorized or anything like that. Uh, and God forbid that I would take the time to do that. That'd be pretty boring, actually. So I have to conclude that, yeah, there were rules against it because they, they didn't do it. But you know, this is going to be the, the priesthood is largely going to be charged with enforcing and setting up their own you know, system of worship and so on and so forth with, you know, with the king and the higher ups and the administration. So the fact that most places don't don't practice this is going to suggest, yeah, there were there were laws against that, too. Generally speaking, though, the laws do aim to bring about a better society. They, they, they have to make life livable. They have to punish crime. I mean, people, people aren't living in these mass groups, and they have the same problems. They have problems with their neighbor. They have problems with theft. They have problems with, you know, graft and unfairness. They have problems in, in their marital relationships. They have problems in business relationships. They have all the problems we do. So you have to have a legal system to make life livable. And they do. And they, again, there's, there's abundant textual testimony to this. There's lots of law codes. The fundamental difference, though, between Old Testament, the Old Testament law codes and the whole Old Testament system and other ancient Near Eastern systems is that Israel's 
system of laws and its its legal codes derive from a relationship, a covenantal relationship between Yahweh and the people that is based on love, God's love for Israel. This is Deuteronomy 7, 7 and 8. That, that is, that's it in a nutshell. That is unique in the ancient Near East. You don't find you don't find covenantal codes based on love that sort of give the logic to the whole civilization. Israel has that. We actually spend a week or so in, in my 201 Awakening School of Theology class on this. There are other things that, that make Israel's laws and Israel's culture different, but this is the fundamental difference. Um, again, the the covenantal relationship there in Deuteronomy 7, 7 and 8. Maxwell wanted to know if after reading Jesus, the Incarnation of the Word by David Mitchell, if you think Melchizedek is a Christophany like David does, the way that he presented Melchizedek was very convincing that he was an appearance of Christ and that there can't be two internal high priests. You seem to agree heavily with the rest of David's content in those books, but it seems like his thought of Melchizedek is different than your past episodes on Melchizedek. Yeah, I'm, I'm not persuaded that Melchizedek was a Christophany. Um, I still lean toward the relationship being typology, not a Christophany. If, if Melchizedek really was a king, for instance, then you'd have an extended Christophany over a people who didn't come from Abraham, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. I mean, who's, who's he king over? It's not the people of Abraham. I mean, Abraham's in the picture. So that doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. Um, two internal high priests. Well, all, all that Psalm 110 requires is that there's a second order of high priest. It doesn't look for two at the same time or anything like that. It just establishes the order. And if Melchizedek is, and he is, the first priest mentioned in Scripture, that is the higher order. And it's outside the line of Aaron. It takes preeminence. That, that's all you need. So I'm, I'm not persuaded that Melchizedek was a Christophany. Ed has our last question, and it's about the Naked Bible Podcast, episode 86, the head covering of 1 Corinthians 11, verse 13 through 15, everyone's favorite, right? Dr. Heiser has said before, why did it take so long for us to figure this out? What did this imply for inspiration is scripture, concurses? God obviously knew that doctrine was being advocated on bad science, as well as how many generations would pass misinterpreting and causing harm because of it. Well, first of all, I would ask what harm was caused. Just because it's not scientific doesn't mean it was destructive. It's bad medical theory. Again, for those of you who don't know what we're talking about here, you have to go back and listen to Naked Bible episode 86. I'm not going to rehearse it here. Um, it's bad medical theory, you know, but I can't see how it would lead to physical harm of anyone or termination of life. It's, you know, it's not nearly as bad as missing the boat, for instance, on germ theory. You know, that would certainly be destructive. Uh, it was a bad idea about how life came to be in the womb. Um, I would also say it wasn't universal. Paul's tapping into Greco-Roman medical, medical texts here, medical theory. The Jews, for instance, this isn't, this isn't where they're going uh, with this. They, they're going to be, you know, more often using the planting metaphor and whatnot. Or, but you know, this goes beyond that. It's just bad medical theory. As far as inspiration, I would say go go up to YouTube and, and search my name and the word inspiration and you'll find out what my view of inspiration is and I'll answer this question in more detail. In, in a nutshell, I don't think God cared how the information or how the idea of submission, not submission in, in 1 Corinthians 11, but modesty, and and you know warding off this this threat of the angels you know repeating what happened in Genesis six, that that was the proposition that was the point of concern. How that gets communicated, I think, is incidental. And you're right, God did know that it was bad medical theory, but again, God chooses people as to who they are. He doesn't convert the writers into modern thinkers before he uses them. He didn't do that with anybody else. I mean, there are lots of things that the biblical writers didn't know that we know 
that would have been bad science. So what? And the, the, the points that he's trying to communicate, or that God wants them to communicate, they are perfectly capable of communicating them, even if they're using, you know, an incorrect means to do so. So I, I distinguish between the proposition, you know, the idea that God once conveyed, and the means by which the proposition is expressed. God lets his, the ancient writers that he has prepared for, for doing the task, God lets them express the idea in whatever means, however they're able to do so. And God is content with it. Again, I have, I have something of a long write-up on this, too, in, in my FAQ that you know, is just dealing with this, this idea of primitive science in the Bible you know, more generally. So if you went up to the FAQ and looked down at the last question in the FAQ, you're going to run into it. My views on inspiration are, are on YouTube in a number of places. I would recommend watching that. You know, God lets the writers he prepared express what he wants expressed according to the means by which they can do it. He doesn't reinvent the humans into superhumans or scientific humans before he'll use them. He just doesn't do it. The question, I think, somewhat also confuses biblical authority with inspiration. I mean, all of it is inspired because ultimately it, it has its point of origin in God's decisions as to who to, you know, who to task with writing scripture, so on and so forth. But that doesn't mean that it, you know, it has equal authority. The propositions are what have authority, not the means by which the propositions get expressed. That can be changeable and malleable and pre-scientific and, you know, left up to the writer. But as long as they accomplish the task God wants them to, to accomplish, God's going to be fine with it. We know that because he was. You know, this is a good example of it. I mean, there are others. We don't need to launch out into others. But this is a, a perfectly good example of God letting them express an idea, something he wanted expressed, using means that God knows are, are misguided in terms of the science that will come to, to light in future generations. But God doesn't stop them and say, wait a minute, I, I need to make you a scientist first before we can finish this page. He doesn't do that. I'm ready to tackle them if you are. Sure, let's All go. Right. Our first one's from Scott in Cincinnati. In Genesis 22, Abraham calls the place of the sacrifice Jehovah Jireh. Yet, in Exodus 3, God tells Moses that by his name, Jehovah, was he not made known unto Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Is Genesis showing evidence of anachronism, or is God's point something else in Exodus 3? Yeah, I think the actual reference here is Exodus 6.3. I'm just, I'm just going to read it for everybody. Uh, well, going back to verse 2. So this is Exodus chapter 6. God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty, but by my name, the Lord, in other words, the divine name, Yahweh, I did not make myself known to them. So that's Exodus 6, verses 2 and 3. Now, if you go back to Exodus 3, you know, obviously the, that's the revelation of the divine name uh, in that passage in the burning bush, but I think this is actually the, the verse that uh, Scott in Cincinnati is thinking of. He asked if this is evidence of an anachronism or is God doing something else in Exodus 3. This passage, Exodus 6, 2, and 3, is ground zero for the JEDP theory. That is the theory that, that would deny mosaic authorship of the Pentateuch. Um, and this is one of the, the, the main, the main go-to passages um, to justify uh, that a source critical approach where the, the Torah, the Pentateuch, was not written by Moses, but was is, is actually the result of, a, of the weaving together of at least four, and, and JEDP theorists would say more, but at least four sources by uh, an unknown editor or a team of editors uh, at, at some point in Israel's history that they they both they they either simultaneously composed these sources and then somebody later put them together or they were sources that that had been in existence for a while through oral tradition 
and then then got put together into a coherent document that we know as the Torah or the Pentateuch, first five books of the Old Testament. So there, there's there's really no way to answer this question, on, on, you know, without getting into the whole JEDP theory. Uh, this is not, you know, just a simple anachronism. Uh, this is this is coupled with a lot of other things because. If we take Exodus 6, 2, and 3 at face value, and where, where God tells Moses, hey, I didn't, I didn't you know, appear to the patriarchs with, through my divine name. I didn't, I didn't use my divine name with the patriarchs. Well, then how do you get it back in Exodus 22? Well, the answer is an editor put it there to, to make all of the sources, these, these disparate sources, J, that are named J, E, D, and P, the four main ones. Again, there are more than four, actually, if you get into the whole system. Some editor somewhere to make these documents sort of appear as, as one cohesive story would use the divine name in different places to sort of unite the sources and make, make the narrative come out as, as a cohesive whole. One of the criterion, uh, criteria, one of the criteria for the JEDP approach to scripture, uh, or at least approach to the Torah, is, is what's called the divine name criterion. And that is, you know, which, which divine name are we talking about? So the way the standard theory goes, the J source uh, would be a, a, a document that, that is readable on its own. It, these are various strands of the Pentateuch, various sections of the Pentateuch. That if you if you took them out, if you pulled them out and put them together, they could be read as one coherent document, uh, and and that source is is labeled J, uh, after the divine name Yahweh. The, the, the Germans were doing this, so the Y sound begin actually as the letter J. So the the Yahwist, J A H W I S T, is, is referred to uh, as one of these sources. So. We, we, we've got sources divided up on the basis of which divine name was used. So one source uses Yahweh. Another source will use all of all of the L names. And, and this is where you get the patriarchs. El Shaddai, okay, something like that. Elohim. Uh, the, the divine name changes, or at least this is the theory. So the E document is, is this hypothetical document where again, you can read about the stories of the patriarchs in Israel's history. Again, the parts of the content of the Torah. Again, I have to assume that, that my listeners know what, what's in their Pentateuch to some extent here. So you could, you could pull out all of the verses, all of the sections that use one of the E words, El Shaddai, Elohim, El. One of you know the, these kinds of names for God, and if you put all those together, the theory goes that that the E document could be read as a standalone document all by itself. Then there's the P document. The P document also uses Elohim as a divine name. There's the D document, which is for Deuteronomy. Uh, that's going to use both. I mean, it, it gets very confusing very quickly to to somebody who who isn't reading the Hebrew text. Um, it's it's very hard to to teach people what the JEDP theory says, especially you know in a format like this, like you know, just an oral podcast. But even if we had a classroom with a blackboard and, and, and PowerPoint slides, it's it's difficult to conceive how scholars are conceiving this. But you they would run across passages like Exodus six two and three and say, ah, here we go. Here we go. I mean, Moses himself, the, the, the Torah itself says that God didn't use the divine name, you know, the Yahweh name up until the, the encounter with Moses. We'll just put it that way. Up until, you know, God has encountered Moses at Sinai. Before that, it was some other name. And so the, 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 this invites the Torah, the Pentateuch being divided up um, by the divine name used. Now, there are other other you know, elements, J-E-D-P, it's not just the divine name. Sometimes the Pentateuch has two or three versions of the same, excuse me, the same story, the same event. Uh, the, the most most obvious example of this is in Genesis 1 and 2, where 
you know, ostensibly one account of the creation ends with Genesis 1, 26 and 27, the creation of Adam, creation of humankind, male and female. Whereas if you go over into chapter two, you have a separate creation story for Adam and Eve, uh, you know, as you keep reading. They're created separately. So which is it? Which, which, which is the story of creation? The one in Genesis 1 or the one in Genesis 2? And again, source critics would say, well, this is proof that you have, you have two separate stories that an editor has put together. And you know, so there's, there are what are called doublets. That would, the, what I just explained in, in, in Genesis 1 and 2 would be an example of a doublet story that occurs more than once. There's the divine name criteria, you know, and there, again, we're not going to get into a JEDP class here. It's just impossible. You could spend whole semesters on this. And, you know, in graduate school, we had to, we spent a whole seminar, a whole semester uh, on, on, on JEDP because this is standard biblical, biblical criticism uh, nowadays. This is standard biblical studies nowadays. So that's what you're seeing. That's what Scott in Cincinnati is seeing. He's seeing it, this, this verse tell him something that apparently ought to be pretty obvious. But when you go back into the text, it's not obvious because you have both divine names appear in one verse. Okay, or you have Jehovah appear earlier. You know, Jehovah is a false name anyway, but Yahweh you have Yahweh appear uh, earlier than, than the encounter with, at the burning bush. You have the divine name used. So what's going on? Well, that what I just explained to you, that, that is, is one view of what's going on, that you've got multiple sources of the Pentateuch, and the, these are vestiges, that, these are things you can detect in the text that lend legitimacy to the idea. Um, you say, well, what, what about if we don't believe in JEDP? Well, then you believe in something else, okay? You can be someone who in, insists on mosaic authorship for every word of the, of the Torah, which I don't. You know, I'm, I'm not JEDP, but I'm not traditional view either, because I, I, I just don't think it's defensible in, in a number of respects. Um, again, this isn't a class on JEDP, so we're not going to get into all the details uh, but but again, it, it, this 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 whole question depends entirely on your view of the authorship of the Pentateuch. I'm what used to be called a supplementarian. I think there was a, there's a mosaic core uh, to the Pentateuch, and I don't I don't see any reason why Moses couldn't have written um, whatever this core was again a substantial amount of the Pentateuch. But then I I also think that there are, there's editorial work going on in, in the Pentateuch as well. So I'm somewhere, I'm something in between what used to be, you know, people used to believe in a mosaic core that was added to as time went on. Uh, like Genesis 1 to 11 would have been a separate, you know, authorship event. Genesis, you know, the, 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 from the patriarchal stories forward, you have oral tradition that the people and the Israelites in Egypt would have been preserving. And then they get codified, they get written down, you know, ostensibly by Moses or somebody else. You have, you know, events of, of the exodus and the wilderness wanderings that, that lended themselves much more to an eyewitness account. So you'd have, you know, mosaic authorship there, but not other places. So that it, that, 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 that's what I am. And now I say all of that to say this. You can translate Exodus 6, 2, and 3 differently so that it doesn't say that this is the first time that Moses encountered the divine name or the, or, you know, the, the divine name was held back uh, until, you know, later. Now, I only know of one scholar who has argued for this uh, alternate translation. And the alternate translation is legitimate. It's found in a book by uh, Sir Francis Anderson. I think, I think he was Sir... Anyway, Francis Anderson, maybe he's not Sir, but uh, Frank, as, as we knew him in the office, <laughs> uh, Francis Anderson wrote a book called The Sentence in Biblical Hebrew. And in that book, he argues for a different way of understanding Hebrew sentences in different places. And Exodus 6.2.3 is one of those places for him. 
And so he has it come out as just sort of a, a statement about, again, we really started off with it with a winning question here, stuff that you can't illustrate in a podcast. We might as well call this question. Um, he just translated translates it in a different way that you don't get source source sources out of it. It's about the only thing I can say here, without the audience not knowing some Hebrew, and to be able to unravel and, and explain this. So, my my advice to Scott in Cincinnati is take your pick. You know, you could you could do some learning about JEDP. Evangelicals are typically horrified at JEDP. Not evangelical scholars, but evangelicals, the, the average person in the pew, because they think that, that later references, like in the New Testament, where Jesus and others refers to the Pentateuch as the law of Moses, that that must require that Moses wrote all of it. I don't believe that for a minute. You know, the law of Moses is just a way of referring to the Pentateuch. Moses is the main character. What else would you call it? The law of Joshua, the law of Levi. No, you would you would call it the law of Moses because Moses is the lawgiver in Israel's story. That's the role he played, and so the the, the law is mostly about what happens. The Torah is mostly about what happens in and around his life. Uh, obviously, the first eleven chapters and the patriarchal stories that isn't true, but once you get it. Once you get past the book of Genesis, the whole thing is Moses, okay, Exodus through Deuteronomy. So really, it's only the book of Genesis that doesn't concern Moses. Everything else does. So again, it'd be very natural to, to refer to it this way. But you have people push back that say, well, you know, Jesus took it as the law of Moses. He quotes stuff in Genesis, like, like the Adam and Eve getting married, you know, when, when Jesus discusses marriage, you know, the, have have you know the male man and female you know become one flesh and so on and so forth and he calls it the law of Moses. Well, again, that's what it is. If he was quoting Daniel, you would call it the book of Daniel, even though the book of Daniel never claims Daniel wrote it. You would call it Daniel. But that's that's because it's all Daniel, all Daniel all the time in, in the book. What else would you call? It? I'm not a believer in the phrase law. Is required mosaic authorship. Uh, but I'm also not of the disposition to think that JEDP is, is a sound way to approach things. I think ultimately J, the JEDP theory is based on circular reasoning. Um, but anyway, that, that's just my take. So I'm, I'm what used to be called a supplementarian. And I'm, I think I'm going to draw, the, draw this question to a close at this point and basically say that's the best I can do in a podcast on this. Um, we can't have a, a full class on JEDP or what it is, you know, why it, why it, there might be something to it, why it might be based on circular reasoning, you know, alternate ways to understand a Hebrew sentence. Um, you, you just can't do that in, in, a, in a podcast format like this. Mike, can you real briefly remind everybody out there why Jehovah is a false name? Because... Because the, the, the four consonants of the Tetragrammaton, the four consonants of the divine name, are not spelled that way. I mean, they're, they're, there's no vocalization uh, given for the divine name. The, the, the vowels from Adonai are taken and applied to YHWH to create this name. But but the but the name isn't a real name. The, the name is is the con, is a, is the contrived result of taking four consonants of one word and the vowels of another word and putting them together. And th this was done because the, the the name of God was not something to be. It, it wasn't used in regular discourse. Scribes would write it. Obviously, we've got it a few thousand times in the Torah, thousands of other times, you know, in the Hebrew Bible. Um, so they would write it, but they wouldn't say it. Uh, and, and so this became the convention uh, in, in writing to use the consonants. But then once the vowels were invented in, in the Middle Ages, to use the vowels of, of the, the word Adonai as the vowels for YHWH, even though everybody knew that they weren't the real vowels.
Perfect. All right. Scott in Cincinnati. I am a Cincinnati fan for the next few months because I have Joe Mixon. Uh, that's my running back. <laughs> so. Well, what, what loyalty. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. All right. Um, our next question is from Randy. Luke 2.52 says, Jesus increased in wisdom, stature, and favor with God and man. I was listening to episode 138, and you mentioned an ancient Israelite would say three things cause a depravity in the world. The fall in the Garden of Eden, the sons of God and daughters of Eve, and the Tower of Babel. Am I reading into scripture my own interpretation when I see the Edenic fall was for a desire for wisdom? The hybrid spawn of terrestrial and celestial gave human stature while the Tower of Babel incident was intended to give them favor and a name. Am I out and left field on this? Right. So the, the question refers to the, 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 the threefold uh, cause of depravity. Like, like Trey just said, the fall in the Garden of Eden, Sons of God episode in Genesis 6. By the way, the, the women there are never called the daughters of Eve. That's a little C.S. Lewis there. <laughs> and the Tower of Babel is, is the third one. I, I, would, I wouldn't say you're out in left field here. I would say you're out beyond shortstop. <laughs> but, uh, what, you're new, what you're doing is you're noticing possible literary connections. Uh, that, that, that's what you're doing, which is all, always an interesting and, and in many cases, fruitful exercise. Jesus is the second Adam, according to Romans 5. That's what he's refer, how he's referred to, which can suggest things like he was the antithesis of what happened to humanity in the early parts of the biblical story. So, you know, once you have Jesus cast as a second Adam, then that, that draws the, that, that, that creates the impetus to start thinking about him as the new Adam and ways that Adam and Jesus contrast or might relate to each other, you know, compare and contrast. That's all really that's happening here. Uh, and, and, you know, Randy is, is postulating, you know, a, a few possible literary connections between the material in Genesis 1 through 11 and material outside Genesis 1 through 11. Now, having said that, again, I don't think you're in left field. I think you're, you're out beyond shortstop. I would want to see something more textually rooted, like specific vocabulary of the Septuagint being used in, in the way that he, his question described. Uh, I, I would need to see it specifically used in Luke 2.52, uh, in Luke's description of Jesus, so, so that that would sort of telegraph to me that Luke wants us to see something in the Septuagint of either Genesis 3 or Genesis 6, or Genesis 11, you know, or Deuteronomy 32 for that matter. But beyond that, that's the only way you can, you can really prove a literary argument to show literary connections, in this case, in the, in the Greek of the New Testament and the, in the Greek of the Septuagint for these passages. And, and to my knowledge, as far as the vocabulary, you don't have, you don't have these meaningful overlaps. So I, I would be I would be predisposed to not buy what Randy is selling here, but I, I don't think it should be characterized as being out in left field. I mean, this is, this is just having a good eye for things that, that, that might have some relationship to each other. So to me, I would put this in my needs to be thought about more file and, and needs more investigation. There's, there's a possibility that there might be something intentional, but, I don't think Luke does a very good job of telegraphing it. Uh, if it is, I, I would need more than, than what's there in Luke 2.52. Matt wants to know if forgiveness is once and for all. After a person has repented and asked for forgiveness for their sins and accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, do they have to keep asking for forgiveness every day for the rest of their life, or is forgiveness once and for all? Well, when you confess your sin, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and you know, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I mean, this is 1 John 1, 8, 8 through 9. And again, for those who don't necessarily have that memorized, let's just go there real quickly. Uh, if we Let's go back to verse 8 here. Uh, let's see. If we say we have no sin, 
we deceive ourselves. This is John writing to believers. And the truth is not in us. So we're going to sin. We're going to sin as believers. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. When you confess your sins, they're forgiven. And that doesn't mean that you never need to confess another sin. That's not what that's not what the passage says. I mean, the answer to this question is 1 John 1, 8 and 9. Again, we're going to sin as believers. We, we confess our sins and we believe that God forgives us our sins. We don't have to confess the same sins the next day. You confess the sins you commit. Uh, again, you don't, you don't keep cataloging them and having to rehearse them every day or else we, you know, you'd end up with quite a grocery list in a day or two. God will forgive you if you confess. You know, it doesn't mean that, that you accept the gospel and then you never have to confess another sin either. It doesn't mean that either. In 1 John 1, 8 to 9, I would say it means what it says on both sides of that coin. Keith has our next question, and he is trying to make sense of Samson's behavior. Samson, <laughs> Samson seems to be a real jerk, not a role model that yeah. you want your kids to admire. Is this the kind of person that God designates to be the leader of a nation? Well, sometimes, you know, <laughs> I mean, Samson was never the leader of a nation. Let's just start there. He was a judge and the judges are localized leaders. You actually have different, you, have, you actually have judges functioning as a judge, doing their judging at the same time. Some of them are concurrent. It's the only way the, that, the Old Testament chronology works out for the book of Judges. But again, without getting into all that, Samson is a judge. He, he is appointed at, at some point to get rid of a problem. That's typically what a judge was appointed for, to, to directly confront an oppressor or an aggressor against the people of God at any given particular time or place. And so in Samson's case, the problem is the Philistines. Uh, he's also a jerk. I mean, I, I think it is an appropriate characterization. Uh, so he, he doesn't, he's not the best character choice. But the problem was God had, had come to Samson's parents before he was born and told them that he was going to use the child, told them the child was supposed to be a Nazarite, so on and so forth. You know, God, God was, was preparing to use him. So in, in, in one sense, you know, God obligates himself to using Samson because this was his intention. Samson does the job, but he also does a lot of stupid things, a lot of jerkified things, if we want to put it that way. He's, he's not a good example right, to, to really really anybody, except maybe, maybe at the end of his life. It's about the only selfless thing he ever does. It, it's also the only time he ever prays in, in, in the book of Judges is when he's about to die. Um, again, there's all sorts of, of things that would make Samson a, a less than admirable person. But he is the person God chooses to get rid of the Philistines. And so sometimes, you know, God, and I listen to how I say this, sometimes God chooses imperfect people to do something. Well, newsflash, we're all imperfect. Okay, Samson was a jerk. We're not minimizing that. But if if, if God was waiting for you know, a, a perfect person to use. He'd be waiting a long time. Now, there are instances that get close to this language where at least the person in question is is notably righteous. Let's just take Noah. You know, he's 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 the one who's righteous in his generation. So you you, you do have instances like this, but but we can't say Noah was sinlessly perfect either. I mean, we all know the the full Noah story. We we, we know we're going to conc- you know we're not going to conclude that. So, you know, this is a little bit like asking, why, why would God choose David? You know, let, let, you know, Samson's easy to pick on. What about a guy like David? I mean, David does some of the worst things imaginable. But he's still, again, God's choice of king over Saul. God does forgive him, so on and so forth. So the, the, the quandary here is why does God use anybody? I mean, that, that, that's the larger you know, issue because everybody's going to be a disappointment. Everybody's going to do something. Everybody's going to misbehave uh, at, at some point. So I think we have to remember that. 
And you know, look at look at Samson's life and you know, his birth and his life. It showed that God had a plan for him. God persists in the plan despite Samuel or Samson's flaws. God, you know, continues with the program. He knows what he wants to do through Samson, and he's going to get it done. Samson's going to suffer for his his behavior. He's going to suffer for his mistake, and so will other people too. So it's it's a it's an imperfect situation. But God makes the most of it in the period of the judges where everybody's doing what's right in his own eyes anyway. So he doesn't have a whole lot to choose from. I, I also think maybe maybe the way we, we teach Samson to, to little kids is a problem here too. You know, sometimes we, we exclude things in the Bible and make these, these characters out to be the heroes that they aren't or more of a hero than they are. I think that's certainly true with Samson. Christine from Southern California often hears Dr. Heiser refer to Jesus Christ inheriting a new Eden here on earth, which makes sense considering the reversal of events that took place in the original Garden of Eden. However, I am confused about how John 14, 2 states Jesus' words when he says he goes to prepare a place for us in his Father's mansion. Jesus says that if he goes to prepare a place for us, and will come again and receive us unto himself. So where is he? We may go also. If this place he's preparing us on earth, wouldn't he phrase this differently? Is there something in the text that clarifies this passage that I'm missing? Yeah, I, I think what's missing here is, is the new Jerusalem, uh, to the new earth at the, at the end of the book of Revelation. So I, th- I think, I think the, these statements about Jesus you know, where does he go? Well, he goes to the spiritual world. You know, at the ascension, he goes back to be with the Father. That's where he goes. He's not hes not somewhere on earth. He's not somewhere on the planet uh, that, that we could go to with latitude and longitude and, you know, fix a GPS location to. I, th- I think I think what's in view here is, is there's, there is something that needs to be worked on, and that is you know, on the, on the spiritual side of things in the spiritual world, but that world is going to descend to earth at the end of days. And I think that's the missing element here is the way to combine both these thoughts anyway. So that the new Jerusalem descends to the earth as part of the, of, of Eden being remade. Again, having said all that, we, we can't be so literal, you know, with these passages and concepts in the end. We're not restricted to living only in the New Jerusalem either, you know, even when that descends to the New Earth. It's not like we have a need for housing at all. We don't, we don't need a housing in, in the New Eden, in the, in the New Earth, you know, in, in, in the, the circumstance of everlasting life. We're not going to suffer the effects of bad weather or other undesirable conditions. You know, given the nature of our spiritual resurrection bodies, we don't need individual domiciles. We don't need that. We don't. We don't need lots of things that we're, that we're probably going to experience in the, in, the, in the new earth. You know, just even the whole concept of embodiment. We, it's it's hard to think differently about these things when when the only life we know right now is we do need these things. You know, how, how can we imagine ourselves to be of such a, of a nature where we don't need this? We don't need protection from weather. We're, there's not ever going to be any, anything that, that, that would, we'd need protection from in, in terms of the environment. Because it's a, it'll be a perfect environment. It'll, it'll be what Eden was originally intended to be perfectly. Uh, again, we, we tend to overly literalize this language. And then sometimes we realize we're doing that, and then questions like this come up, which is a and it's a good question, you know, because you, it helps to see that well maybe maybe we're overreading this a little bit. Again, I think the solution is to see that there is something being prepared in the spiritual world, which we can't fathom because we're not part of it. But that world is gonna is gonna descend to Earth as part of the process of Earth being remade. That, that, that's the picture of what's going on in, in, in the everlasting condition that we're going to find ourselves in and what we think of as heaven. Even the designation heaven, we're not going to live in the sky. We're going to live in the new earth. You know, well, heaven, why, why did we even use that vocabulary? Why does scripture use that vocabulary? 
because it's a word you would use to denote where God is. God is in the heavenly places, up there, way up there, up there beyond what we can see. Again, we are forced by being embodied spatial beings because we are embodied spatial beings. We are forced to talk about the existence of eternal life with words like housing. We're just forced to do it because there's no other way to conceive it. So that what the Lord is promising in John 14 is a future eternal home using domicile language, okay, the, 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 multi, the multi-room tent, you know, as I've heard it explained so many times. Um, and, and there's something to that. We have domicile language, which is appropriate for an audience that would know only that sort of existence, which would be us. What our eternal home will really be like extends far beyond John 14 and really far beyond our ability to even conceive it because we don't need embodiment anymore. And, and we're in a perfect environment. And how, how we talk about that is difficult. And so what, what, what Christine is detecting here, again, is one of these inherent difficulties with it. Kevin wants to know if Dr. Heiser has read Scott B. Nogle's article, God of Heaven and Sheol, The Unearthing of Creation. In it, Nogle argues that Earth in Genesis 1-1 should be translated as the underworld. What are Dr. Heiser's thoughts on this? Yeah, I haven't read it. Uh, the, the idea is appealing. That doesn't mean it's right. <laughs> I mean, no, Nogle does good work, but this sounds... It sounds a little unconvincing. I'd have to read the article to buy it. And here, here's why. I like the implications of it, especially for reading Genesis 3, you know, as being cast down to the underworld, which is how I think Genesis 3 should be taken. But I suppose Nogel is arguing that heaven and underworld makes for a better merism. Uh, a merism is a statement that's all inclusive. So he's, Nogel, Nogel's probably saying, that heaven, because of, of, of Israel's three-tiered cosmology, heaven, earth, and, and what's under the earth, that if we, if we would translate Genesis 1-1 as God creating the heavens and the underworld, it encompasses the entirety of the three-tiered cosmology. So it, it, it's a better merism. A merism is a statement, again, that it is, is designed to express totality. That's, that would be my guess as to what his argument is. So I, I, I kind of like that. But then what do you do with the rest of Genesis 1 where we get a day-by-day accounting of the earth being filled and no specific mention of the underworld? You know, I, I don't know. I, I, would, I would need to be I, – I need some persuading on this even though I like the implications of it, but I haven't read it. Our last question is from Peggy. And she remembers someone once asking Mike what music he listens to. One thing on his list is Handel's Messiah. I would love to know more of what Mike likes about it. I'm not sure I can quantify it. I, you know, in general, I like big choirs. <laughs> uh, I like you know large choirs. There's something appealing about as well about taking large sections of scripture and putting them to music, which is what Handel's Messiah does. I, I, I like the themes of it. I think you know, the, the way it's done is really smart. You know, people tend to think they, they equate Handel's Messiah with the Hallelujah Chorus. And, you know, that, the Hallelujah Chorus is about 1% of Handel's Messiah. So if, if you like large choirs and you like classical music, it's kind of hard to beat. Uh, I, I basically had the whole thing memorized in college. I listened to it so often. Uh, I can't claim that now, but it's, you know, most of it is still instantly recognizable when I hear it. But yeah, I, I don't, I don't know why I like it. I just do, you know, I, I guess that, that's, that's the best reasoning I can give to it. All right, Mike, good enough. Is there any other type of music? I mean, rock, you got to like rock, right? Rock and roll. I can just see you now. Rocking I, don't, out. I don't like much of it. I don't like much of anything. I'm just not a music person. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm very eclectic. Uh, for instance, I like, um, 
I like small group harmonies. So I like a song like California Dreaming. Mm-hmm. Doesn't mean I doesn't mean I like anything else by that group. ACDC. I like Vi- no, <laughs> no. To me, that's a waste of time. I'm just trying to get you to admit that you rock out while you read the Bible. Like that image in my head needs to happen. That needs to be true. Movie themes. Movie themes I tend to like because I like Star Wars movie theme. Yeah. Yeah, I think John Williams was a genius. So he he did did all the music for that. But, uh, I mean, I I like Weird Al, too. You know, I'm I'm all over the place. It's just Weird Al was a genius, too, or is a genius, shouldn't use the past tense of it but yeah very eclectic very spotty i I never really listened to much of anything yeah yeah well but at the time of this recording too i wanted to ask you uh, any thoughts on the queen passing today oh i know you're a history buff i mean are you yeah we well my my wife and i we watch the crown if, if they if they ever bother to make another episode of it and I don't know why you need two or three years in between episodes. That's what it feels like. We're we're kind of in into the subject matter. If you watch that, it's hard not to be. So it was. I mean, it was sad, but I mean, she was ninety six, so she led a full life yeah. for sure. But um, yeah, I was still. I was surprised. You just get used to her being there. <laughs> yeah, I saw that yeah, she, the older, she was the older queen. Somebody is. She was queen. I saw a stat that she was. Um, on the throne for a third of American history. That's crazy. Can that be, can that be true? Yeah. Yeah. 14 U S presidents. I mean, she was on the throne for over 70 years. It's a third of American. That history. Is, that's, a, that's astonishing. It is. It really yeah. Is. You need to, you need to hit at least 70 to be talking about thirds. Yeah. Yeah. I guess, I guess she would have been close to it. Yeah. All right. Perfect. Sounds good, Michael. All right. Why don't we just go ahead and jump into these questions and uh, knock them out if you don't mind. All right, here we go. Our first two questions uh, are from P and first one is what is going on in first Corinthians five, three through five. It sounds like Paul's spirit is actually remotely present. Is this something similar to Peter's angel when he escapes prison? No, back in Acts 12, in Peter's angel, that's, the text tells us that, uh, for one thing. You know, Paul's just using it, an expression in 1 Corinthians 5. Let me just read this so that people have it in their heads. It says, For though absent in body, I am present in spirit. And as if present, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. And I, I don't know any other way to put it. It's just an expression. I mean, I can, I can say right now, I'll be with you guys in spirit. That doesn't mean that, that my spirit is going to leave my body and, and there's going to be a disembodied me somewhere else. You know, it's just it's an expression of fidelity. Uh, that's all Paul's doing here. We know this because he actually says, says, for though absent in body, I'm present in spirit. And as if present, I've already pronounced judgment. So he, he's, he knows he's not actually present. And then later on in verse 9, you know, he talks about writing to them in a, in a previous letter. And then in verse, let's see, let me back up a little bit. First Corinthians 4, 19, he says, but I will come to you soon, if the Lord wills, and we'll find out uh, not the talk of these arrogant people, but their power, so on and so forth. So he, verse 21, he says, what do you wish? Shall I come to you with a rod or with love and a spirit of gentleness? So he tells them twice he's not there. He tells them twice he's going to come and, and see them. And then we get this expression, I'm with you in spirit. So that, that's really all that's going on. There's nothing, nothing weird or paranormal going on. All right, P, second question is, is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil what the Sumerians would call a meh? Some of the ancient works have trees being called mez. While I don't think they are referring to the same trees, I do wonder if it would be proper to view this tree in Genesis as a meh. The short answer is no. Um, the, the, the meh, it's, it's just M-E. It's, it's, a, it's a two-letter word. 
met in Sumerian is, is an abstract concept or an abstract noun. I have an article open here. The article is entitled, it's by Jacob Klein. The title is Sumerian Meh as a Concrete Object. And it's from some scholarly journal, Alt Orientalische Forschung, some German journal, 1997. Klein writes this. He says, it is a common knowledge, haha, at least to those who do Sumerian stuff. <laughs> it is a common knowledge that Meh is an abstract noun referring to cultic, cultural, political, or social institutions, norms, laws, functions, attributes, etc. Uh, this is me breaking it down. In other words, the Sumerian meh can refer to just about anything. Uh, it's, it's an abstract concept that's very, really unfamiliar to us. If, if you're thinking something like Plato's forms, that, that, that might get you in the ballpark, but it's not that either. Back to Klein, he says, however, the precise meaning of this abstract concept is elusive, and therefore it has been subjected to many different translations. In other words, and this is me now, how do we, how do translators describe what is meant by that? It's not very easy. It's actually pretty difficult. So Klein continued, it raises serious difficulties. Consequently, it has been suggested by Greg, it's another author, that in the course of its development, that seems to have acquired concrete connotations. Perhaps those are the symbols connected with the persons, places, or institutions. And then Klein says, in the present paper, I will try to demonstrate that the term meh occasionally refers neither to the abstract concept, not to a concrete object connected with it, but to a two-dimensional symbol or image engraved or painted on a sign, a banner, or a standard representing the underlying abstract concept. I'll just I'll close the quote there. But basically, the, the, the meh is a very, far, very foreign concept to us. It, it could be used of almost anything in Sumerian culture. Uh, again, cultural, political, social institutions, norms, laws, functions, attributes, so on and so forth. So, so there's no way to, to pin it to a, a tree necessarily. Although it could, could refer to a tree because trees, you know, in that list, uh, again, just basically on next, almost everything. But to use that and, and say this is the, the, the tree of life, it's just way off the mark. The two things really have nothing to do with each other. Our next question is from Ruth in the San Francisco Bay Area. I recently listened to episode 86 of the Naked Bible Podcast regarding head coverings and 1 Corinthians 11, 7. Jumped out at me. For a man ought not to cover his head since he is the image and glory of God, but woman is the glory of man. Looking at the various Bibles I have on hand, I see that Genesis 1, 26 is listed as a cross-reference for the verse, Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. I had always understood Genesis 1, 26 and 27 as conveying that females are in God's image too. But is there perhaps some ambiguity in the Hebrew so that it could be interpreted as saying in effect that females are created by God just as males are, but only males are actually created in God's image? It doesn't 1 Corinthians eleven seven suggest that only males can be considered to be God's human imagers. Yeah, well, the, the short answer is to those two questions is no and no. There's really no ambiguity here. The Old Testament text in Genesis one twenty seven is is crystal clear. Hebrew Adam, it's the Hebrew word Adam, is made as God's imager. And it has to be humankind because Adam is qualified in Genesis 1.27 as both male and female. There's, there's no ambiguity there. Both male and female are Adam. They are humankind. So Genesis 1.27 isn't about Adam, the male, because he's not male and female. He's male. And Paul's going to be aware of all this, you know, in Genesis 1.27. He's going to be just as aware of it as we are. He's not going to contradict it. 
The patriarchalism of the Bible is about social status, not ontology, not what a person is intrinsically. Children, male or female, for instance, are viewed as lesser in social status to adults. But again, you know, when we're dealing with social status, not ontology. You should note as well that 1 Corinthians 11, 7 doesn't say that the woman is the image of man. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say that the woman is the image of the man, but the glory of man. It never says woman is created after man's image. That wording just isn't there. By default, with Genesis, all of humankind is in the image of God. Scott from Amarillo, Texas, asks, Is a message from the Garden in Eden and the events or message in the Garden of Gethsemane in any way related? Yeah, the key here is the phrase, in any way related. Uh, I think, personally, we're meant to see Jesus' acts and events in gardens, generally, as playing off the Old Testament motif of gardens as both the dwelling place of deity and also as a feature of the household estates of kings in the Old Testament and in the ancient Near East more broadly. We actually discuss all of that in episode 335, Jesus as the Gardener. So I'm just going to refer that episode to Scott uh, from Amarillo. Episode 335, Jesus as the Gardener, goes into this a lot. Wesley was wondering about names in the Old Testament. First question is, he's got two, is, as you know, people's names have meaning beyond just the word itself. Often they are closely tied to their character, physical attributes, or even future calling. My question is, is there any evidence that names were given to a person retroactively? Do names continue to gain even more meaning over time as well, or built upon brick by brick, like Jesus' name being closely related to Joshua, but obviously better and then being talked about in Hebrews as an inherited name that is better than even divine being's name? Well, boy, this is this is a good example of a thesis question. Um, I'll I'll go out and get another degree and <laughs> write my dissertation on this, and then come back and answer it. Um, fortunately, there are such books that already exist about names, biblical names, and things like that. Generally, for sure, with place names, there are changes. And, and you get this sort of retroactive feel to it. For instance, in Genesis 19.21, uh, the place where Lot and his family flee is referred to as Mitzar, which means small or insignificant. And then the, the name of the place gets referred to from here on after as Zoar. So Mitzar and Zoar are related, they're related terms. Um, so in that, in that instance, you, you can see where it could be retroactive. Place names also get changed. So Jerusalem's original name wasn't Jerusalem. It was Jebus, J-E-B-U-S. It gets changed when, once David you know, takes, takes the place. Or there's actually a dispute over when Jerusalem's name was changed um, and how to understand the relationship between Jebus and Uru uh, But it, it's a long, convoluted topic. But it, again, I'm just using it as an example. This happens with people. People get their names changed. The most obvious ones are Jacob uh, in Israel. Jacob gets changed to Israel. Saul gets changed to Paul, so on and so forth. It's, it's much harder to tell with birth names. You know, in Jacob's case, he could easily have, be assigned to Providence that you know, God knew what, what kind of person Jacob was going to be, and so on and so forth. But that, you know, that's not always that easy to tell. Um, I'm going to just give... By, by way of a better answer to this, or potentially a better answer to this, I'm going to give Wesley a few uh, studies here. Because, again, I'm, I'm not going to go out and write a thesis you know, to answer this question, very obviously, but, but there are those who have devoted book-length studies to biblical names. So I found this list, a convenient list, in an article here I have in front of me uh, by Marx, the article is entitled Biblical Naming and Poetic Etymology. It's from the Journal of Biblical Literature, Volume 114, Number 11, 1995. This may be accessible publicly on the Internet. I'm, I'm not quite sure, but Biblical Naming and Poetic Etymology. And in his first footnote, 
you can note some comprehensive surveys of biblical names. So I'm going to give you the ones in English. There's a book called uh, by Burke Long. It's B-U-R-K-E, first name. And then Long, just like it sounds. The Problem of Ideological Narrative in the Old Testament. Now, that's the book title. Now, ideological narrative is, is where someone or something gets a name and it sort of tells the story or reflects the story uh, about itself. So, again, there's a whole book on that, The Problem of Ideological Narrative in the Old Testament. Uh, there's another dissertation by Alan Ross. Uh, Alan Ross used to teach at Dallas Seminary as well back in the day. And he did his Cambridge dissertation on paronomasia. That has something to do with, uh, that's just a technical term. It has something to do with biblical names and name calling. Paronomasia and popular etymology in the naming narratives of the Old Testament. There's another dissertation, Russell Cherry. Paronomasia and proper names in the Old Testament. Subtitle is Rhetorical Function and Literary Effect. That's a Southern Baptist Theological Seminary uh, dissertation. And more recently, there's a, a book by Moshe Garciel called Biblical Names, a Literary Study of Midrashic Derivations and Puns. So here you get into punning, which of course is going to, going to crop up, you know, in familiar Old Testament stories as well. So again, the, the short answer is, yeah, you can have these sorts of changes, but how would we know it's retroactive unless we're, we're told in the text that, well, this was the name at one point, and here's this is the name now going forward. In other words, the text would have to tell you that it's being done retroactively. You, you can't just guess that and then say, well, I, I must be right about this because it makes sense. So, but I, again, we, we, we try to be text-driven here. And so the text itself would have to tell you this. But it, it takes, takes us into the whole field of, of why things get named the way they do and sort of the rhetorical function and the literary function of naming uh, in the Hebrew Bible. So, and again, there, there are good resources for this. They're book-length studies, and for the sake of a podcast, that's about the best we can do here. Question is from Sarah. Is persuasion a proper translation of pistis, and does it cancel out the implication of loyalty? Uh. You no, know, persuasion is not a proper translation of pistis. I mean, if you just, for one thing, words, biblical words are like like any other words. They don't have any meaning in and of themselves. They have to be, the meaning is from the context. Every word has sort of a semantic range of, you know, options. And pistis is no different, you know, there than any other word. I mean, if you just look up some some passages where it occurs, like Hebrews eleven six, you know, without faith it is impossible to please God. So really, are we supposed to say, without being persuaded, it is impossible to please God? I mean, Hebrews eleven six actually defines faith. Let me just uh, quote it here. I don't, this is going to be ESV, so I don't want to mess it up. Without faith, it is impossible to please Him, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists, that he rewards those who seek him. So it doesn't say for whoever would draw near to God must be persuaded that he exists. Persuade and believe there are, are, are kind of close, but this notion of, of sort of being talked into it or, or you know, debated into it, I think is really wrong-headed. Romans 3.22 is sort of another example. We look at Romans 3.22 the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ. So, really, the righteousness of God through persuasion in Jesus Christ? I mean, it doesn't even sound you know, normal. It sounds actually kind of weird. I, I don't know what, what source this, this idea is coming from, but it's not a good one. I don't know of a single you know, academic biblical studies lexicon or, or commentary that's going to make this equation or linkage. The verb equivalent of pistis is pistua, which no one disagrees means to believe. Okay, that's the verb equivalent, pistis, pistua. They come from the same 
saying the word for him, it has nothing to do with works or persuading someone to get whatever word study or whatever resource that this is being relied upon, uh, you can sort of safely put down and, and not use again. Well, a lot of, a lot of stuff like this I have found comes off the internet. The internet has a few biblical studies resources and none of them are very good. I mean, I hate to say that, but I got to be honest with the audience. The biblical scholars are, are not free resources on the internet. That's not where the scholarly material goes. It's not where the academic material goes. It's not where the, the peer reviewed material goes. It doesn't go to the internet. You know, the internet, whoever creates these sites, they're, they're, they're doing the best they can. I, I don't want to poo poo them unnecessarily, but, but you have to realize if you're going to do serious Bible study, you need to start investing in real sources. Stuff that's not free on the internet. Uh, I'll add one more thought. If, if you were to get Again, some, some good resources. Uh, I would, for New Testament, I would recommend the New International Dictionary of New Testament Theology and Exegesis. It's a four or five volume set. It's an expanded, what I call discussion lexicon. A lexicon is just like a dictionary, but there are some that are, that are made where, where the words are not just listed and English glosses, you know, English possible meanings aren't just listed. You get full-blown scholarly discussions of each word, and that's what the N-I-D-N-T-T-E is. Um, if, you, if you actually looked up Pistis there, you would find that the, the way that, that the resource orders the or arranges the material is it, it'll group Pistis with the rest of the words in its sort of family. So you have you'd have an entry on Pistuo, that's the verb to believe or to trust. Pistis would be in there. Pistas, which means trustworthy or faithful. I mean, you can't even convert that to a to a persuasion adjective. Persuasion worthy, persuasion full. I mean, you know, I don't even know how you do it. But it, pistas is in there. Pistapo means to make trustworthy. Uh, and, you, and you get you get antonyms as well. Apistos, which means unbelieving or unbelievable or faithless. Apistia is unbelief. Apisteo, to disbelieve. You see all these these words, they all have the same thing in common. It's the P-I-S-T, pist element in the word. They all come from the same word family. Uh, this the, the word for, to be persuaded is, is patho. Okay, pistis has no relationship etymologically to patho. So again, I would have to, to, to firmly disagree here. Uh, and just say we need to be using better resources. Our next question is from Joel. Is the Leviathan in the same being that's in the Garden of Eden and also the dragon in Revelation? The core verse my question regards is Isaiah 27, 1. But Job 41, 33-34 also seems to support this idea, and so I wanted some clarity and to hear if this is also part of theology that's not as well known or talked about. Well, Le- Leviathan isn't a real creature, for one thing. So that's going to that's gonna make it quite different than the serpent, the Nakash, in Genesis 3, because we find out in, in Scripture later on, you know, much later on in the New Testament, that the, the quote-unquote dragon, you know, the serpent, is Satan. And, and the only way to, to put those two things together is, is to do as, you know, as I've insisted and taken criticism for that the, the serpent, the snake, in Genesis 3 is not just an animal. It's not a mere animal. It, it's a supernatural being, you know, in that form or in that guise in the story. Because this being is also cursed. And this being seed will, will have an adversarial relationship with the seed of the woman, who is ultimately the Messiah. Okay, that, none of that applies to Leviathan. Leviathan isn't a real being or a real creature. Leviathan is a is a mythological concept or a symbol of chaos, represents chaos. The scripture does use a variety of serpentine images for chaos uh, and, and chaos agents, that's true. But the one in Genesis 3 is presented as a personal supernatural enemy to God, whereas the others are more like just symbols. With Leviathan would be a symbol of, of anti-Eden, you know, everything that is 
sort of oppositional to God and, and God's world the way God wants things. So there, there, there's some overlap there conceptually in, t- in terms of the symbolic value, but in terms, in ontological terms, they're not the same thing. Taylor in Como, Mississippi, is listening to the podcast, uh, the Exodus series, and Dr. Heiser read the three-day journey as literal and thus limiting the possibility, lo- the possible location of Mount Sinai. I've often read, heard that a three-day journey isn't just an idiom for a long journey or a complete journey, as opposed to a journey that took two plus one or four minus one days. Can you comment on this? Well. Uh- I, there's not too much I can say about this because I need to see examples of that outside Exodus before I would consider it a possible way to interpret Exodus. In other words, what are the actual examples where a three-day journey is more than three days? That, that we know that reading Scripture. And without having examples of that, I don't know if Taylor has any, but without examples, there's not much I can say to that other than I want to see examples. Samuel has our next two questions, and the first one is, who are the thieves and robbers that Jesus is referring to in John 10, 7 through 8? Yeah, the, well, let's just read the passage, 10, 7, and 8. Okay, Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. And verse 9 says, I am the door. Okay, this this is a very famous passage. So if we consider the passage, the phrase, all those who came before me, uh, if we sort of focus in on that a little bit, that would suggest that the persons involved, the thieves and robbers, quote unquote, were previous false messiahs, previous people who claimed to be the Messiah and were not. Now, historically, we know there were such people before the advent of Jesus. I mean, this is just a matter of Second Temple Jewish historical record that there were those who claimed to be Messiah. So it could point to those individuals specifically. However, if the phrase refers to the strangers in the preceding verses, if we go back to the beginning of, of John chapter 10 and, you know, look at it that way, if the phrase refers to the strangers, and that's the terminology that John uses in the preceding verses, then it seems better to take the reference to quote-unquote thieves and robbers as the false shepherds, those who are strangers to the sheep in the passage, which would in turn be a slam against the scribes and the Pharisees more specifically. So I think you've got a couple interpretive options there, either one or the other. And, you know, I, I would probably land on the scribes and the Pharisees to just I think the context is a little more, a little, little tighter, but, but it could be the former, uh, false messiahs who preceded Jesus. Samuel also wants to know if scholarly historians in secular settings use scripture as a staple resource for historical research and context. What other written resources are used as primary sources for historical education in the academic world? Yeah, most do not. Uh, they, they argue, and I think very inconsistently, that the Bible's religious nature makes it a lesser source or invalidates it as a historical source, at least as a source that you would use as a starting point for historical inquiry anyway. And I say that's very inconsistent because throughout the ancient Near East and the Greco-Roman world, you have writers writing things, and the writers are inherently religious. For instance, if you know, I could pull out a document, you know, the, the treaty between Ramses and the Hittites, or you know, something like you know Ramses' account of the Battle of Kadesh, where he invokes his God, you know, and, and, and credits his God with delivering him and with his victory, and yeah, you know, it, it's it's laced with Egyptian religious stuff, but historians take it completely at face value. In other words, the religious elements of ancient Near Eastern material and Greco-Roman material don't rule out the historical value of a document for historians, but they seem to change their tune regularly when it comes to the Bible. And I think that's because the Bible is a little bit different than these other sources. The Bible insists on, on, um, how do I want to say it, 
you owe something to it. It insists on accountability, personal accountability for your life. If the Bible's real, then there's, there's some personal accountability issues that are involved, spiritually speaking, where that these other sources would not make on a person's life. And so I, I tend to think that's really what's lurking behind the non-use of the Bible. Again, if, if they're being consistent, Practically everything in the ancient Near Eastern world is laced with religious talk. Monumental inscriptions, primary sources of all types, historical annals, historical itineraries. Uh, you know, these, these are the sorts of things, king lists, that would, would go into reconstructing history in, in, in the ancient world. And a lot of that material is going to be inherently religious in flavor. And if the religion doesn't doesn't invalidate those documents as historical sources for historians, I don't see why the Bible should either. But again, I'm trying to be consistent. A lot of historians are not, just to put it simply. All right, Mike, we appreciate uh, you taking the time to answer our questions. And uh, that's all that we have for this week. So why don't you go get some rest? Yeah, we'll try to do that. We'll try to do the best job we can getting better. All right. Sounds good. All right. And with that, I want to thank everybody for listening to the Naked Bubble Podcast. God bless. Thanks for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, visit www.nakedbibleblog.com. To learn more about Dr. Heiser's other websites and blogs, go to www.drmsh.com. 